Hear me? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Awesome. Uh, welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for being here. Um, we are going to be talking about getting started with registered reports. Um, my name is Van Montoya. I'm going to introduce our wonderful co hosts um, shortly. Um, if you want to access the slides, if it's helpful for you to follow along with them, you can use this link here or scan this bit.ly link. Um, and uh, if you don't want to write it down now, it will be on the last slide as well. And so if you're like later, you know, we've convinced you that you want the slides, um, then you can access them again. Um, so today we're going to be hearing from uh, two wonderful and one okay speaker. <laughs> um, so uh, we're really excited to have here uh, Dr. William Krenzer, who is um, at Duke University as a, as a scientific integrity research quality manager, um, which is quite a mouthful, um, but we're really excited and thankful to Idri for funding uh, William to come here and talk to us about uh, scientific integrity. Um, we also have a wonderful um, uh, the Tristan Tibby, uh, who's a PhD student working in my lab um, in the Department of Psychology. Um, and I will wrap everything up today. Um, and I am Amanda Montoya. I'm an assistant professor in psychology. Um, so this is our uh, panel of experts today. Um, so what are we going to be doing? So in the first section, um, William is going to talk about kind of the basics of what is a registered report. It's a kind of new thing. And so um, we want to give you kind of how it started, why it exists, what it is. Um, and then we're going to have a 10 minute coffee break. But at any point at which you want a scone or a coffee cake or a whatever is in the back, um, feel free. There's coffee and water there. Um, but we'll have a couple breaks because it's a long, long session. Um, Tristan is going to talk about the ethics around registered reports. So one of the kind of major benefits of registered reports is that it helps us uh, introduce more ethical practices into our research. So Tristan is going to talk about that specifically. Um, and then we'll have another break. And uh, I will wrap things up with some practical advice for implementing registered reports. Um, our lab now has done a number of these, and I've been involved in quite a few, and, and um, so we'll try to give you all of the tips and tricks um, to actually doing this. Um, super. Just for an introduction, um, feel free to ask questions throughout. We're a nice small group, and so um, uh, I think William will lead us in a little bit of an introduction to each other. Um, but feel free to ask questions, either shout out or raise your hand, whatever you feel comfortable with. Um, I think we have a couple people joining us on Zoom, and so um, we'll have somebody monitoring the chat, um, and uh, if that person, which will be one of us three, will kind of rotate, um, can answer your question, then we'll just do it in the chat. If it's something that we feel like should be shared among the whole group, then um, that person might raise their hand um, and ask your question, and it will be answered verbally, and then we'll summarize it in the chat as well. Um, so yeah. I think I'm going to hand it over to William and we'll get started with what is a registered report. Wonderful. All right. Wonderful to see everyone here. Uh, so, yeah, I'm going to be here to talk about what is a registered report and kind of get through this basic concept of what it is, why it's here, uh, and some of the benefits of actually doing a registered report. But before we get into that, uh, there is seven of us. Well, there's 10 of us in this room, but seven of us who aren't presenting. So I'd love to just hear your area of research. You don't have to tell me much more than that, but what kind of area of research do you do? What is your kind of research you conduct? You don't have to say anything, but there is only seven. Of them, so yeah. I'm Maria. I'm a postdoc in the behavioral decision making department at UCLA. So uh, I do research, uh, let's say, between social psychology and marketing. Okay. Behavior. Okay, very cool. Okay, right. thanks. Thank you. Others who would like to share? I'm not going to force anyone to do it, but yeah. I'm a graduate student in the quantitative psychology program. Very nice. Okay, quant site. Yeah. Uh, I'm a student, a grad student in the developmental psychology, and I've been taking a lot of Amanda's courses and have been seeing all the sprinkling of medical <laughs> science and how to um, be like ethical in terms of how you go about your registration and registration. So I'm excited. Awesome. Yeah, I'm sure Amanda has. Hasn't pushed it too hard, I would imagine, <laughs> in her classes, but uh, good. I'm glad to be here. Developmental psych. What else? Anybody else wants to say? Yeah. 
Oh, very cool. Nice. Nice. We have to see on site decision. Anyone else want to share? Don't want to. That's fine. All right. Well, we'll go ahead and get started. So let's start off by talking what is a registered report. Before we get into what an actual registered report is, let's just kind of think about some research uh, topics, generally speaking. So what is research? Um, the Webster's Dictionary defines research as the systematic investigation into and study of materials and sources in order to establish facts and reach new conclusions. So this is all nice and safe. This is what we can say we do. We do this type of research. But what does this actually look like when we're conducting research? Uh, we think about research as a broad kind of concept. It might not fit for everyone. We think back to this kind of scientific method that we've learned for the last 20 years in school. All right, so you formulate your question. You have some type of idea that you want to look into more. And after you formulate your question, you generate a hypothesis of what you think is going to happen, right? So you're doing research now. You're generating a hypothesis. You're having uh, ideas of what's going on. And then you may go and gather and uh, generate data. You may have already had data and you're going to be analyzing the data, whatever it may be, but you're getting data to answer that question that's going to answer your, whether or not your hypothesis was correct. <clears throat> then you're going to analyze the data and draw conclusions based off of the data, right? And then this is going to hopefully help you answer your hypothesis and answer your question, which then you can then communicate your results and take action, right? You may want to try to publish it, you may try to get on the news, or you may realize that you were wrong and your data didn't support what you thought, right? And then that helps you formulate a new question, right? So this is the con basic concept of doing research, right? Again, it might be different depending on your area of research, but this is the general kind of thoughts when it comes to conducting research, right? Formulate a question, generate a hypothesis, gather data, analyze that data, and then come up with some type of results and then communicate it somehow. So what makes research good or what's good research practices? Um, this why does not make sense to me now. My apologies. Um, well, following the scientific method process doesn't mean that you are going to be doing good research, right? Just because you do the scientific method doesn't mean that your research is good. And why is this the case? Uh, well, because as researchers, right, we are under a lot of pressure uh, that we conduct both meaningful and significant research, right? We feel this kind of pressure on us. Uh, and these pressures may lead us to ensure that we are finding the results that we need. How many people would say that they feel this kind of pressure? Yeah, yeah I do. That's good. If you, if you don't, that's great. But <laughs> if you do, that's also okay. That happens. But this is just a, this is a safe space. You can say, yes, I do have this. Uh, I think we will talk about some of this later on, but this is kind of that pressure uh, publisher perish method that you can feel in academia, right? Where you feel that you have to get these results. And if you don't, you may not succeed, right? So because of this, this could lead to people doing things intentionally or unintentionally bad research practices. Uh, Daryl Bem, this is a popular paper that came out in 2011 uh, in psychology. Uh, Daryl Bem proved that ESP is real, right? ESP is extrasensory perception, right? So this is seeing into the future and these kind of things. Um, right off the bat, right? As scientists, regardless of your own spiritual political views, this isn't real, right? ESP is not real. It can't happen. But Daryl Ben proved that it was real. Uh, as a fun side note, uh, this, this man, J.B. Ryan, invented ESP from Duke University. He was an ecologist. And he came up with ESP. He just really liked the idea, and he was the one that generated ESP. But back to the point of this. So what Daryl Ben did in 2011 is that over the course of many years, he ran nine experiments involving more than a thousand participants uh, to prove that ESP was real. Uh, this was published in one of the top tier journals uh, in social psychology, JPSP, or Journal of Psycho uh, Personality and Social Psychology. Uh, and over the course of this 10 year period of conducting experiments, Ben again successfully demonstrated while using questionable research practices, the, that participants in his research could predict the future. And we'll talk more about questionable research practices later on, but these are things like e-hacking or harking, uh, you know, hypothesis after results are known. These are the kind of things that Ben was doing to ensure that he could say that his participants were, were seeing into the future. Um, ben has never admitted to doing any of these things. Uh, and, in some cases, right, he did have statistical significant results. Uh, and so it is this kind of question of, did he do anything wrong in that end? Um, that is not for us to decide here, but 
So it's just to know that these are issues that we can see when it comes to doing research. Uh, another popular paper that came out in 2015 uh, was from uh, Brian Nozak over here and the Open Science Collaboration. Uh, this is where they uh, try to replicate 100 studies from these three journals, Psych Science, JPSP, uh, and a Journal of Experimental Psychology. Uh, and they use a consortium of researchers from around the world to help uh, replicate the studies from these uh, papers. Uh, and here is the distribution of the original p values from those 100 studies, right? We can see 0.05 is right here. About 96% of them are all significant. Who would have thought? Now, when they replicated them, we see that only about, uh, I think the answer is 30 of them came out to be statistically significant. The other 60 something ones shown to not be significant. Now, this distribution shows this lack of replicability from these original studies that were conducted. And this can show that there is these kind of issues when it comes to publication, uh, that we may see some type of bias in some of these significant results being published, but we also may see that some studies may not just be replicable and this could be a problem. And so this is all kind of pointing out to this issue that we see in research that maybe there's a better way that we can conduct it. That brings us up to registered reports. Let's, let's take a quick second here. Any questions, thoughts, concerns so far about just the history of research and, and how we do it? Okay, that's what I assume. But, all right, registered reports. What we have here is two different timelines that we see on the top. Right, we have traditional manuscript process. This is the one that we're used to. On the bottom, we have the register reports. I'm going to walk through each of these. I just wanted to show them to you so that you could see them. So don't worry, these are going to come back up. But we're also going to quickly talk about what these three little uh, key terms are on the bottom. I just want to show this so you can see it. So first, we have stage one peer review. This is the peer review in register reports that happens prior to any data collection or analysis. Okay, so that's what a stage one peer review is. An in principle acceptance is the publication of your study, regardless of statistical outcome, right? This is within registered reports still. And stage two peer review and registered reports is the peer review that's ensuring you followed your original plan. So these are just the key terms that we'll walk through when we walk through registered reports. But again, before we get to registered reports, let's walk through what going through the traditional manuscript process kind of looks like. And this is what you all may be familiar with. All right, so we're traditional manuscript process. Think uh, again, back to our, um, uh, uh, scientific method. We're developing our idea. We have some thoughts of what we want to kind of research. So we're creating a hypothesis. We're creating these questions. We go out and we design our study to answer those questions. And we collect and analyze that data. And then we're going to go ahead and write up our manuscript, write up a report. So we're going to write up our introduction, our methods, our results section, and our discussion. And then we're going to go ahead and submit that to some type of journal, right? So now we have our manuscript completed. We think it's great, it's beautiful. Let's get it published somewhere. And now we submit it to a journal and we get our peer reviews, right? So this is where we're gonna start getting our peer review comments back, assuming we make it past the editor, right? Assuming we can get to that process. Now, in this peer review process, you may start getting comments such as, you need to run more analyses. That's unfortunate, just spent so much time doing this. Now I have to go and do more, but okay. Uh, or your study is not adequately powered. You'll need to run it again with more people. That's unfortunate. Now I'm going to spend more money and go do this again, but okay, that is what it is. Uh, or there's a compound in your original design of your study. Now you have to go ahead and run another study. Well, that's very unfortunate because now we have to do more. Now we have to go back to the books and we have to write another one and go get more participants as well. Or reviewer two might tell you, this question is uninteresting, not worth exploring. Don't we already know this? So now you've spent all this time, all this energy and all these resources for a reviewer just to say, it's pointless. Why are you doing this? You should stop. But you go through this process and you work with the reviewers and you get this kind of done in hopes of getting it published, right? In hopes that you can have your manuscript published at that journal or at least at some journal. Now, this process could take many iterations. It could take shopping your journal around, but the goal to make goal, right, is that you will get it published. Now, this is a fun chart, sad but fun, of somebody who's going through this process of getting a paper published. Let's see, is there? I don't know if there's a point on this. Oh, there is three. Uh, so we can see February 2020, this individual who posted this on uh, Twitter, so you can find them, uh, tried to submit a two-study paper to JPSP. I'm not gonna walk through the 12 different lines that we can see here, but we can see from February of 2020 all the way down here to the bottom of July of 2022, it took the individual nearly two and a half years to get what was one paper published into two papers separated, that original one separated into two, published elsewhere. Now, 
there was something that happened between February 2020 and January 2021. The whole world kind of shut down. So there is some, some error there for time. But we can see it took shopping this around to nearly a dozen different journals to get one paper published into two when you actually had to add more, right? So this is the process that we can see. We think about the manuscript process. Once your research is done, once you have your questions, it's all good to go, you, you're done. But that's when the real project really starts, right? Because now you have to get it accepted somewhere. So this, as you can see here, can be very happy to start. And then very sad, 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 only to hope that you can originally be relieved that it's done. Now, this is where we're going to try to avoid, we're going to try to avoid this with registered reports. All right, so let's go ahead and walk through a registered report process. All right, we're going to go ahead and start with developing our idea. Same kind of thing, generating our hypothesis, creating our questions, seeing what we have. And now we're going to go ahead and design our study. So this is where we're going to go ahead and figure out, okay, what kind of mechanisms are we looking for? What kind of conditions, what kind of variables are we interested in studying? And at this point, we're going to stop as researchers, which is hard. Researchers, we like to keep going, right? But now we're going to go ahead and stop, and we're going to start writing. So we're not going to do our study. We're going to start writing. What we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and write our introduction. And we're going to write our introduction in the way of why we are designing our study. And then we're going to write our methods, which we've already discussed here up to this point, what we're interested in doing. So now we're going to write our methods section. Last thing we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and write a results section or a results analysis plan. This is either gonna be, if it's a results section, you're gonna leave numbers blank or put in X's for the numbers, or you're just gonna write your analysis plan of how you're going to analyze your data. All right, so at this point, we've stopped doing or collecting any data. We haven't done any of that yet, but we've written three sections of our manuscript. And now what we're gonna do is we're gonna submit that, those three sections, to a journal to go for review. So haven't collected any data, haven't analyzed anything, haven't done any of that other stuff. We've just written our first three sections of our paper, which are the main chunks of the paper, right? That's the big part. And we're submitting those to go for peer review. Now, again, stage one peer review is if you're lucky enough to make it past the editor, right? You still have to have a good paper to get past that editor. Right? The paper still has to be adventurous. So you submit it to a journal, and now it goes past the editor and now it's going under review. And now you can start getting comments like, you should plan to run more different analyses uh, or to test your question. That's fine. We haven't done anything, right? We've written our analysis plan. So it's easy to go ahead and adjust accordingly so that we can adjust those uh, analyses the appropriate way. Or your study is not adequately powered. Why not add more people or more data points? Again, I mean, easier said than done. It takes time, it takes money. But it's easier to address now because you can say, yes, you're right. Maybe I do need to raise my power a little bit more so that I can get it. Maybe we do need to collect more participants and we need to extend how long it's going to take. Or you get the feedback, there's a confound in your original design, let's fix it. It's a lot better than in the original one where you're like, okay, now I have to run another study. Now you can say, oh, let's fix that confound so that it's easier to address now. And it's not gonna be there. Or you still may get a reviewer two that says this question is uninteresting, not worth exploring. It's a lot better to receive that now, a lot less demoralizing than after you've already run the study and already run the participants. So now you can say, okay, you're right. Maybe we didn't think this through. Let's go ahead and adjust accordingly if we can. So you go through this process, you work with your peer reviewers, you go through the peer review process in hopes of getting the in principle acceptance. Again, that in principle acceptance is the journal saying, we will stand by you, we will publish your paper regardless of its statistical outcome. So regardless if you find statistically significant results or if you find null results, we're going to publish your paper. So now you have the in principle acceptance, you have that in your back pocket. Now you can go ahead and collect and analyze your data, which ideally, if you've written your analysis plan, you have all your code and everything ready, all you have to do is collect your data and then once you have your data, you run your code and then you're done. And your results section can fill out and you're good. You have all your analysis. But now that you've collected and analyzed your data, you can go ahead and finish up the rest of your reports. And now you can fill in your results section. And now you can write your discussion section to explain what supports what you found or explains what, why it didn't work the way you thought it was going to. That's what your discussion section will be now. And then after you have your discussion section written, you'll go ahead and submit that paper again back to the same journal for stage two peer review. And this is again asking, did you do anything else? So. You wrote, your, you wrote your analysis plan. Did you do anything outside of your analysis plan? If you did, that's fine. Just write that out as exploratory analysis. It wasn't stuff that you had pre 
a priori thought about. It was just stuff that you decided to look at. And that's fine to do. Just make sure you write it accordingly as exploratory. Or uh, do the claims uh, from the study, are they supported by, uh, not supported by your data? And if so, can you address why? And after you go through stage two of your process, that's when you can get the papers published and it's out there and it's ready to be received. All right, this is usually a good time to stop and ask questions if there is any. Are there any questions about the register report process up, up to this point? Yes. Is there a concern in terms of like when you submit for the design of the study that the the idea of your study design will be like used by other? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so that's a great question. We'll address that later on as well, but. Um, there is no evidence at this time to show that uh, anybody who's participating in the reports is being scooped more so than anybody else, right? Uh, that anyone who is participating in just your traditional manuscript ways uh, probably are gonna be scooped just as likely as not. I think scooping doesn't happen as much as we are afraid of, but do we think it does, right? I don't think it's that big of a concern. It can happen. And it can especially happen if you're at smaller universities and don't have the power to be able to run it as much as bigger universities. But again, scooping isn't as big of a deal as we think it is. Uh, but yes, there's always going to be a fear of being scooped when you talk about your research, but I don't think that that's something we need to worry about in terms of registered reports. It doesn't happen as much uh, generally as we think, and I don't think registered reports is um, worse off because of it. So relieve anything or make more questions? <laughs> I don't want to say no, right? Like, I don't want to say scooping is not going to happen uh, because you, who knows, right? I would say personally, myself, I would think individuals that are participating in register reports, both as a researcher and as reviewers, are probably individuals that are going to be participating in scooping. Right? There are individuals who are following this kind of process and think that's going to be good. And I think there's better chances of being scooped elsewhere than register reports. I'll add to that. I think like the the thing to remember is that your stage one peer review, like the stage one submission, doesn't get published anywhere necessarily, and so it's not that the whole public knows what you're going to do. Um, and so the biggest risk is in a case where you submit a stage one and it has to get rejected. That, that's the only case where scooping applies because otherwise the journal has already committed to publishing your paper, regardless of if someone scoops you. It doesn't matter. It's already accepted at this journal. So the only case where scooping would really apply is if, is if you submit a stage one peer review and then one of the peer reviewers specifically, so one of three people in the world scoops you. And that's essentially the same as grant submission. Like the risk is the same in that situation as a grant submission, um, where, you know, in a grant submission, you're submitting an idea and there are people who are in theory experts in your area who could scoop you. Um, but we kind of trust the system and we allow that to, to happen. Um, in theory, too, like a lot of the journals that do register reports, they have open peer review, um, not all of them, but more than like the baseline. So you would actually know who your reviewers were. And if they then scooped you, you would have like a record of this process. But I, I don't think that that's happened in any cases that we've seen with registered reports. And um, because of the in principle acceptance, the risk is very low in the sense of like, as long as it gets accepted at the journal, then you're in, even if somebody else does it first. Quote, unquote, first. First. <laughs> <laughs> does that help or is that? Yeah, okay. yeah go ahead. Sorry, so, so scooping is, uh, I'm not familiar with that, is that just stealing? So scooping is, yeah, yeah so, somebody stealing your idea, taking your idea and doing it before you can get it published, right? So um, you can, Thoughts of when this can occur can be thoughts of like if you're presenting free data at like conferences or something, right? And you're, you're having some novel ideas. And these this is when some other researcher that may have more money, more resources, more, more space that they can take it, do it, and get it published before you could. Yeah, I had another question. Yeah. Was, um, in the initial, I mean, in the, in the design study, you, like when you're in the state one review, uh -huh. I was wondering, um, I guess, how much details to include and how um, or if that, if that evolves as you as, as you collect your data or analyze yeah. your data how, how does the uh, yeah very good question yeah so for the design study right you're you're wanting to be as detailed oriented as you possibly can right 
you're wanting to put a, as much information in there of what you're planning on doing, what you're planning on getting as you can. Now, as researchers, right, we know that things can change. Things can happen. You may not be able to get the right uh, the proteins that you're wanting. You may not be able to get the right power or the, the right participants that you're wanting. And that's okay if that happens. That's why you reach back out to your peer reviewer, your, your journal editors. You reach back out to the editor and you say, hey, we're having these issues. Uh, and you pose those issues to them. You pose these things that you may need to change. Uh, and I believe, as Amanda has said before, usually the editor says, okay, that makes sense. Now, theoretically, they could send it back out for peer review. That is an option. But I think most of the time the editors are like, yep, totally understand. Go ahead and make that edit. That's fine. The thing that Richard Reports wants to make sure you're doing is that you're not doing that without telling anyone, right? They want to make sure that you're not just making changes without holding yourself accountable. That's the biggest thing. They just want to make sure that, and that's the reason that they have this stage one peer review. And that's why the reason that they say you can't make changes to some of these sections is because they want to hold you accountable for what you said you were going to do. And again, if you have that in principle acceptance, there's no reason to make these changes, right? Because your paper is going to get published no matter what. So why change minor things to find significance, right? You can just say, hey, you know, we couldn't get that. We couldn't get that, that data set, so it happens. And so that's kind of why we have this, again, you have this in your back pocket, the same with scooping. It's kind of nice. There's no reason to do anything to, to find those results. You can just publish it as it is. Yeah, of course, in the back, sorry. Yes, uh, in stage one, if you get to comment that the study is underpowered, um, and you also find that because of funding, you can't go back to this and just the grant before this conversation you can have. Yeah, that. right. So that's something you need to have that conversation with the editors, with the uh, reviewers, and you can make that kind of claim saying, I don't have the funding for this. And, and that's not something we can do anything more of. And then that's something where, again, you may it may be that maybe you don't get that initial acceptance because that reviewer doesn't want to change. But it's better to have that conversation up front and say these kind of things. I would again say that the editors are researchers of themselves, and so they understand. And so they may ask you to see what you can do to, to make that work. Um, <clears throat> I don't know where your area of research is. So I will say that unfortunately, like psychology, there isn't a link between funding and registered reports right now. Um, there's not a lot of that kind of link anywhere, except for political science is starting to have this connection of uh, if you get a registered report, uh, you can get funding. Um, so we're seeing that, and it could be kind of good for grant writing, but yeah, that, that, and that's important to say too, right? If you have limited funds, it's important to make sure that that information is known. Other thoughts, concerns? Cool. All right. We'll keep going. We got more. So let's look at how registered reports can align with these incentives for us researchers. Uh, so some potential benefits that we can see is that it should reduce uh, publication bias uh, because acceptance is not based on statistical significance. Uh, the publication bias, Tristan will talk about in the next section, so we'll get more into that uh, later on. Uh, but because there's not this need to find point less than 0.005, uh, then there's nothing to try to make this bias of what's getting published and what isn't. Uh, again, moving forward from this point on, right, we should see this reduce in wasted resources of unpublished work. Uh, this isn't to say that your file drawer problem, this, these studies that you have that didn't work now can be published, but it's saying moving forward, those studies that wouldn't be published normally if you went the register report route could be published. And so those null results could get out there. Uh, we should see again an increase in the total amount of publications you could have on your CV. Again, moving forward, if you went this register report route, again, those null results that you couldn't publish before, if you went the register report route, those null results would show up on your CV as publications. And so this is a good way of boosting your CV to be more accurate of the actual work that you're doing. Right? I don't know how many of us have gaps in our CVs because of projects that we've run that didn't work and couldn't get published. This was a way of kind of helping show what that gap is. Uh, and it can also be used to incentivize replications, right? There's lots of studies out there that have just been known for 50 years that no one has ever tried to redo. This is a good way of trying to say, hey, does this, is this phenomenon still relevant? Does it still work? Uh, and again, <clears throat> we should see this reduce in this need for these questionable research practices, such as p-hacking uh, or harking, uh, or any of these things that, uh, again, Tristan will talk about in the next section. Uh, let's go talk a little bit more broad about the implementation of registry reports. Uh, so retro reports started in the journal Cortex in 2013, uh, and as of January this year, there were over 400 journals that were or are accepting retro reports. Uh, we can see a lot of them are in psychology, uh, but there are a lot in medicine, other social sciences, political science, 
uh, and some biology, we're starting to see these kind of increases there too. So we're seeing that it is getting out to more than just psychology in terms of uh, journals that are accepting. Uh, the journal Cortex, again, the one that started it all, uh, they boast uh, have an acceptance rate of 90% of their journals uh, for registry reports. So 90% of their registry reports uh, are accepted and published. Um, this is very high number, right? This is not realistic of what to expect. Uh, we do see that other journals are about 9% acceptance rate. So this is the uh, APS or the APA journals uh, within psychology. Uh, they're just saying about 9%. And this number is probably even higher than that. Uh, because this was in the realm of there's still a lot of papers that were under review. So this could be in the teens. Uh, in comparison, those same journals have an acceptance rate in the 20%, just generally speaking, like 20%. So we see that uh, generally register reports tend to be accepted less um, than normal journals or regular manuscripts, um, but not drastically different. So if we look at some of our um, Acceptance rates of these different journals, uh, we can see that uh, our median two year impact factor is about 2.7, uh, and our median five year impact factor is almost four. Uh, so, fairly good impact factors, again, depending on your area of research. Uh, we don't see anything like doing the journal of medicine that's in the hundreds here, uh, but again, four and two, 2.75 isn't bad to see. Those are good journals to, to kind of get. These are just some of the journals, uh, broadly speaking, that are accepting rush reports. Um, we'll have a link that I can share you on the next page. Um, but JPSB, uh, Academy of Management Discoveries, PLOS Biology, and then American Journal of Clinical Science, these are all ones that are accepting registered reports. Uh, our team has put together a database of registered reports. So this has all the journals that are accepting registered reports. Uh, there's a little bitly link here that you can look at if you want. Uh, bit.ly forward slash rr database. Uh, that will take you to the link. We'll also, it's in the slides, and so you can have it there. Um, through this database, though, you can find all the journals that do accept those reports, and you can organize it by your scientific discipline, uh, scientific discipline so that you can find the journal that's in your area of research. Again, the majority of them are psychology. So if you're not in psychology, there may be, hopefully, there's some that are in your area. Uh, they're they're becoming more prominent, but there's there's still hope to get more. Um, okay, so when it comes to actual uh, implementation of rich reports, uh, there are currently over 200 U.S.-based journals that have fees averaging about $2,500 in order to publish your paper at that rich report. A lot of this is because uh, rich reports tend to be open access journals. And because they're open access, they're not behind a paywall, and so you have to give them money so that they can put the research out there. Um, don't let this $2,500 scare you. I'm just saying this now just so that it's there. Uh, a lot of journals uh, have waivers for students or early career researchers so that this number can be waived. Also, your universities have waivers and have partnerships with a lot of journals so that they can either get rid of this fee entirely or that they can help pay for that fee. So don't worry just because there is a fee. Uh, that, that doesn't mean you can't go there. But this is also something to think about in your future as you're looking to do research, as you're looking to do grants in your kind of grant application, making sure that you can account for these kind of publication fees that you may have. Uh, Amanda, I think UCLA does help, right? Like, I think, yeah, just the so. UCLA library system is really, really good about helping with these. If they don't already have an agreement with the publisher, there's certain publishers that the whole UC library system has agreements with. And um, for other journals, the libraries will usually cover the fee unless you're like some wildly amazingly funded, you know, full professor that they're like, you probably have the money for this. But if you're a student, a postdoc, uh, assistant professor, usually they'll cover the fee, no question about it. And also, if worst case, you also go to your departments too, right? Like, there's always some type of funding to help with this. We want money, we want that kind of stuff out there. So if you find a journal that fits you, don't worry. That you see a fee, just make sure you do your due diligence of again talking to the libraries and stuff to see how you can get that paid for. Yeah, this wasn't there to scare you, just to make sure that everyone's knew it ahead of time. Uh, so time to publication for first research reports. So, uh, like we said, this started in 2013. Uh, and so what we see on this graph over here is that this is the years between the time the journal said we are going to accept register reports uh, to the time that it took them to actually publish their first register report. Uh, so that's what we see this distribution here. Uh, the approximate number is uh, just about over two years it took uh, journals from the time that they say they're going to accept their reports to the time they actually published their first one. So about two years the day that started. Now, we do see that there is some good 
within the first year, um, the 18 journals that have published the first one. Uh, but we do see that there is this kind of drag over here where we're getting into the five plus years. So not bad, good to understand. Again, there's, it's a process. Uh, unfortunately, though, there are a lot of journals that say we're going to accept register reports uh, and have yet to publish their first register reports. I will put a caveat to this is that this was as of 2021 uh, when we collected this data. So this number, these could be better. Uh, but this is important to say that it, there are journals that are about four or five years, on average, about four years into saying they're going to accept register reports and have yet to publish their first register report. Um, there's lots of reasons why this could be the case. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have all those reasons uh, known, but things we can think about is, you know, there could be journal journal editor changes. Uh, as you could have one journal editor come in, is really for register reports, uh, say that we're going to accept it, then they leave, their tenure ends, new editor comes in, and they may not be as for journal, uh, register reports. And so that could be why this is, uh, this kind of, uh, we see this kind of increase. Another thought that we could also see is, is that, um, uh, which we'll show shortly, is that uh, there's a lot of information you need to know if you're going to publish a register report at a journal. Right? There's information you need to know about introductions and timelines, all these kind of things. And so if that information is not on their website, isn't available to you, that could prevent you from wanting to publish at that journal because you don't know, that you have questions. And so there are all these kind of things that we could think about that could be why these numbers are high. Um, okay, well, if we're looking at ways of implementing register reports, there's this good service that I would recommend everyone to look into if you are interested in register reports. It's called the Peer Community in Registered Reports, or PCIRR. And this is a community of researchers that is dedicated to reviewing and recommending registered reports to journals. Now, I'm going to walk through this kind of what this looks like uh, so you can kind of understand this a little bit better. Um, so, what PCIRR does is you would write up your paper just like you normally would to get to that stage one submission, and you would submit it onto OSF or GitHub, that kind of paper, working through PCIRR. What they'll do is, is that they will start the review process for themselves. So they'll take your PDF, they'll say it's either considered for peer review or, or it's not considered, or they will go for peer review. They'll have their researchers peer review it, right? And then you'll go through that peer review process, that stage one peer review process, just like you normally would. And then after you go through that process and the PCIR says, yep, this looks great, they will give you a, a PCIR recommended. They're saying, yes, you can go ahead and move forward to data collection. So up to this point, you haven't submitted to a journal at all, right? Like you haven't done anything with the journal. You're just working through PCIR and they're saying, yes, you can go ahead and get started. So from there, you would conduct your study and then you would finish your study and you would write up the rest of your results and you would submit it again back to PCIRR PCIR would review it, your stage two peer review. So they look at it, your stage two peer review after you've done all your uh, revisions. And then they would uh, recommend your paper to be accepted elsewhere. Uh, and then you would have this kind of citable thing. Now, the, the goal of PCIR is that uh, what they do is that they work with journals that were our PCIR friendly journals. And so what that means is that if you go through this process through PCIR, there are 27 journals that PCIR works with that they say, if you get the recommendation from them, we will accept your paper right then and there, and it won't have to go peer review any further. So you go through this process through them, and then you can find the PCIR friendly journal, and they will accept it without having to go through the peer review process at their journal. Questions, thoughts about this? This is always confusing for me, at least. A nice external source. Yeah. What is the uh, PCIR recommendation rate? Oh, I don't know. Actually. It's really new. Yeah. So it started last summer. Um, and so I don't know that they have an acceptance rate. Everything right. is open. Yeah. So you could probably figure it out. Um, one of the things that I don't think is on this figure that I think is quite nice, actually, is that when you submit PCIRR, they have an initial stage. This the oh the yeah the scheduled review. The yeah so so you can do a scheduled review and what you do is you actually submit essentially like a extended abstract so it's a two page document and that is reviewed and they decide whether or not they're eventually going to send your paper for peer review so it could be like an early desk reject with just a two page document instead of your whole stage one submission prepped and then desk rejected. 
And so that I think is really nice because if there are like huge fatal flaws, um, it would probably be identified as that. And what's also nice again right, with the schedule review is that you can shorten the actual total review time as it is because you're setting a date which you're going to submit your statement peer review. And then they're giving you the date in which they're going to say we're going to have it done being reviewed by. So that's also the draw that we see with uh, the PCIR. But yeah, also this two page abstract that you can submit instead of writing a full thing. So if you have an idea, flushed out idea of what you'd like to do, you can write that up, send it to them, and then you can go through this process. Uh, this is just again saying, re saying the PCIR friendly. So these are again, PCIR journal endorses the PCIR review criteria and commits to accepting without further peer review any manuscript that achieves a positive final recommendation from PCIR. Yeah, two slides. Of course. So, roughly, it is similar to the stages. It's just a digital, like, um, register. Yes, but you're the As I said, they're sending it first to the PC. Yeah. And then they will find specific reviewers. Yeah, so they'll take care of the review process themselves. Uh, so, yeah, it's the same. It's it's the same thought of accepting it to a journal, except for you're not accepting to a specific journal, right? So it's still going through the peer review process. It's just they have their own consortium of uh, reviewers that they have put together from across the world uh, that are going to do the review process. And then you go through this process in the in the hopes of then getting that recommendation to then submit it to one of the 27 friendly journals. There are other journals that they work with, but there are only 27 that they are that friendly status with. Okay, so, so, so it is a specific group of like yeah. yeah, the advantage is because handling as an editor, handling a registered report is pretty different than handling a traditional paper. So actually all of the, they're not called editors, they're called recommenders. Yeah. Um, those like handling editors, they're all trained and they have to pass a test in order to have this role actually. Right. So they're all very familiar with the registered report process. Right. They're like much better at handling these papers and it's all centralized. So they have a larger pool of reviewers to pull from. Yeah. Their instructions to the reviewers are a lot clearer than some of the journals right. um, because it's all centralized and specific to registered reports. Right. And then the new edition is submitting the Yeah. So yeah, so they do want you to like put your paper in online at an archive system, and that, that's kind of how they get that timestamp and they can review it that way. And then still stage two. Yep. And then if it passes, they recommend best day. Yeah. And then again, the, the biggest difference though between the, the traditional registered report way or the normal registered report way in the PCIR is that two page recommendation, like two page pre abstract you can submit. And then the scheduled review, which that doesn't happen when you deal with the journal, right? With the journal, you're gonna to have to submit your full manuscript minus the data collection to go for stage one peer review. For the PCIR, you can get the scheduled review and they can look at a two-page abstract before you actually submit a whole thing. Okay. And so there is a deadline for the, the whole yeah. So you would go through this process and they would say, Yes, we like your we like what you have, you're going, we like your idea. Uh, we will set a date three, six months from now. That's when you will submit your actual manuscript for the stage one peer review. We'll review it. And within so many days, we will have our review recommenders do their review and we'll get you your feedback. So, it's, it seems like it's just expedited because they're more like, or, yeah. 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 I mean, it, it's a great way of going about it. Um, yeah. And they're, again, this is, I think they're grant funded PCIR. They just got a grant, I believe that that's how they're doing this. Uh, but they're all, you know, scholars and researchers themselves. So it's just like reviewers elsewhere who are doing it out of the kindness of their heart and the, and the wanting good integrity with research. Uh, and that's kind of why this all stems. Um, question, you good? Perfect. Uh, so again, there are 28 uh, PCIR friendly journals out there. Um, they're all over the place. These are the four that are just good to point out. Royal Society for Open Science, Journal of Cognition, Addiction Research and Theory, and Cortex. Uh, those are all the primary, those are the big ones I wanted to point out. Um, I added this to your I said you added something. No, you're good. Um, 
there's information available that if you want to encourage to go ahead and fill out the information to encourage to be a PCR friendly journal uh, for other ones. Uh, and you can find the list uh, if you search PCIR, you can find a list of their friendly journals on their website for the other 24. Uh, another good one that's out there for these community feedback register reports is Register Reports Community Feedback. Uh, this is an interesting website that you can think of as a Yelp for register report journals. Uh, so it's a good way of seeing how people's uh, process of going through these journals of submitting rich reports. You can just see how the quality of the review is and how timely the reviews were. And it's a good way of just kind of understanding what you're getting into when you're diving into rich reports at a specific journal. Uh, so this is a good website that you can kind of look into. I think we have a bit.ly link here too, uh, if you want to find that out. Uh, so bit.ly forward slash RR common feed. Uh, that's a good way you can check this, this resource out as well. There's another one that I should have added that I forgot. Uh, there's also a group called Registered Reports Now. Um, do you have that? Yeah. Oh, I have that. I have it later. Okay. There is a good one called Registered Reports Now uh, that we'll talk about later. That's another kind of good resource of trying to encourage registered reports uh, at journals. Uh, lastly, let's go ahead and talk about some of the concerns that people can think of when you think about registered reports. Um, these are, we can look here, we have yes, no, and missing. Uh, it's important to see here that there are a lot of journals that are missing some type of information that we think that is important when it comes to registering or submitting a registered report. Uh, so one, changes in introduction. Uh, about a quarter of them say, yes, you can make changes to your introduction. A quarter of the journals out there say, yes, you can make changes to your introduction. A quarter say no. And half of the journals don't have any information on their websites about whether or not you can or cannot make changes to their introduction. One thing that is important to note here that I will say is that um, when we collected all this data, uh, we want to just see what you can openly find on these on these journals uh, web pages. So we didn't try to create an account and try to actually submit anything. This is just based off what's missing off of their actual website. Uh, we have reached out to journals uh, to ask them to put some of this information on there, saying we think that this would be helpful. Uh, and while some journals have been receptive to it, other journals have also said no one submits our reports. So what's the point of adding this information there? even though that that's it's 22 there. I mean, if you had that information, people would submit registered reports. Uh, either way, this is just kind of what we're dealing with. Uh, in terms of exploratory analysis, is that allowed? We see that almost uh, two thirds, over two thirds of journals do allow you to have exploratory analysis in your registered reports. Again, they just want it labeled as such. They don't want you to claim that as your own original thoughts. They want you to say that, yes, this was exploratory. We didn't know what was gonna happen. We just wanted to look into this. So that's usually they want it in its own little section. Uh, about 40% do allow some type of multiple study. Now, this could be uh, maybe you have pilot data already that you you have, or you've run a couple studies now and you want to do a register report. Uh, you can use that that those studies that you've already conducted as a pilot study for a register report. And you can say, hey, I've already ran these two studies. I'd like to use them to support a register report study that we'll use to help inform how we want to do that. Uh, or you can also have multiple register report studies on one register report. Maybe you have one significant result and you're like, I'd love to explore this more. And you can kind of work through this process of adding another kind of study onto that. Uh, lastly, we see that uh, about 45% do allow you to have some type of secondary data analysis uh, for your entry report. So maybe uh, you just get, came upon a big data set that you've never looked at before. You can do register report with secondary data analysis. The biggest thing uh, that journals say with secondary analysis, they want some type of proof that you've never looked at the data, that you've never analyzed it before. Uh, so there is that kind of caveat, uh, which could be challenging depending on how you get your data. Lastly, uh, we've already talked about scooping. So these are some of the other common concerns. Again, we don't see that this is an issue more than any other type of uh, register or uh, research that we conduct. Uh, funding, we've already also kind of talked about this, uh, that there's not a lot of funding connected strictly with register reports. However, uh, register reports could be a good way of kind of securing funding, maybe you submit a registered report and you get a principal acceptance. So then when you go and apply for a grant, you can say, hey, our study one of our grant has already got an principal acceptance, so it's already going to be published. So if you can help us with funding, we can kind of get this kind of out there more, right? Funding agencies want to ensure that their money is going to be published. And so if you can already kind of boost your application by having an principal acceptance already, then that can help you. Lastly, a big concern people tend to have is time. Seems like registered reports would take a lot longer than the traditional way. Uh, and while uh, it may seem that there's more work up front, uh, the overall time is probably about the same. From the time from start to publication, it's probably the same for both traditional and registered reports. 
again, the biggest cause is that we have to stop as researchers in the very beginning so that we can get those thoughts on paper compared to having the idea and running the study within a week as a social psychologist. All right, that was a lot. Questions before we go to break? Yeah. I think sometimes it's uh, depends on the type of asset that you're using, right? So if it's like a, a national data bank, right, that you may be getting access to, it's showing that you just haven't gotten access to that yet, or when the date that you would be getting access to that. Uh, in terms of if you're maybe a student and you just came on to uh, a, an advisor's uh, team and you're getting access to their data, that's where it can be a little bit more challenging about how can you register. And I think that there, some of the journals will have ways of registering you saying that you haven't looked at any data. It might be a lot of things of just attesting. I never looked at this data before. Uh, and then them recording that. And so then if they were fine that you did it, then that you didn't look at it. And it's not an all or nothing thing. So it different journals have different policies. So there's like a big bucket of like, yes, they will allow secondary analysis. Some of those people, some of those journals say you can never have access to this data before ever. And we need proof of that. Some journals have no clear policy. They just say you can do secondary data analysis. We don't care. And some journals want you to write add a section in your stage one to describe what you've done with the data before. So, for example, if you've um, this is a, a big data set and you specifically you already wrote a paper with this data set and you but you look specifically at a certain set of variables. Maybe you study math learning and so you only looked at the math learning variables. But now you want to revisit the sample and look at the reading variables. You can say, I've never analyzed the reading variables before. Or some people need to analyze the data to some extent to know if it's feasible to actually use that data set. So mm -hmm. education comes up in my mind specifically thinking about, oh, there's this data set out there. I need to know maybe if I study intellectual disabilities, I need to know how many people in the data set have intellectual disabilities to know if this data set is feasible. And so you can say, you know, I requested frequencies for these variables or something like that. And so most of it is about transparency. They just want to know what you have and how it's done. And in the case of like the frequency is like better if someone else laid eyes on the yeah. data and looked at that. Yeah. Good. You mostly want to be in contact with like figure out what the journal's policy is yeah. and then be in contact with the editor about like, you know, what, what their policies are specifically. Do you think it would be a fair concern that a researcher's exploratory analysis is devalued in this format, even if it's like done legitimately and not, you know, not just like looking at the data and saying, oh, that's the most significant thing, but maybe it's something that you couldn't have predicted, mm -hmm. but, <clears throat> Maybe a reader of registered report is saying, I only want to focus on the registered aspect. So what do you mean by devalue? Like it's kind of glossed over. Like mm -hmm. I see that that's the exploratory part. That's mm -hmm. not the registered part. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, I'm not going to pay attention because I'm interested in registered reports. That's what you're saying. I mean, that I think, yes, that could be a concern that that's if the draw of the paper is X and you're seeing Y there and maybe you're not concerned about Y, that, that could be Y could be kind of flushed out, but that could be something that's addressed in your discussion section. Uh, and or as the researcher yourself, maybe you're interested in exploring the exploratory analysis further with another study, right? To actually secure that it's a real kind of finding. That's the key, right? Like that's the point that we're trying that they're trying to make with exploratory analysis, labeling it as so, is so that you're not, you know, type one erroring this and that you, just because you found something mean about this. So uh, I think that's the the point of, of concern there with with it. Uh, yes, it may draw it down, but that also wasn't what the design of the study was. So who knows again if that's a real finding? Yeah, I'd say it's just about transparency. Mm -hmm. That like pre previously or in traditional papers, you could just p hack your way to some mm -hmm. result and then make it the headline, right? And here it's very clear what was predicted a priori versus post hoc, and that's fine. And I think, again, like what William mentioned is that the incremental review where you can do multiple studies as a registered report is a really great way to follow up on some of those exploratory analyses. Say, oh, we found this, and now we wanna do another registered study to follow up on it. And then, you know, maybe the thing that was exploratory in study one becomes confirmatory in study two, and then it can be the headline. 
um, if that's the intention. Other thoughts, concerns? All righty. Let's take a break. 10 minute break. We're back at 1237, 1238. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Zoom's up. I don't know why. And now we'll have a recording. So. That's true. Oh, you have the one with Johnny. Yeah, that's the end. Oh, well. I mean, I'm so much tired. Why do I? I don't even want to engage right now. Only one mile away, so I'll take the same thing to the middle. Well, pretty much one. I don't know why I walked Yeah, that's it. Cool. Mm -hmm. Pretty well. Well, I think it's the best um, yeah, I mean, it's weird because sometimes um, I'll like watch Netflix because I'm sleeping. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and 
Yeah, I'm having like a toilet right now. The version. Oh, nice. I just like. I want to call it. Yeah. I'll only be like one second episode. Okay, one more. One more. One more. Just like maybe two minutes. Just wait. And then I'm like, I can't stop it. So I'm sorry. So I'm like, let me put it right there. Yeah. You're perfect. Okay. 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 It was one in the morning, and we were like, we should stop. And I was like, we could be there all night. And we were like, all right. No, we should go. Okay. Yeah. And then we Yeah, yeah, and he has such 
Is everybody hearing you okay? It's traveling. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Let's start uh, kind of jumping back into the presentation here. Um, so all right, I'm Tristan Tibby, and um, I'm going to be talking a bit about kind of ethics uh, surrounding registered reports. And so just to kind of jump into this, we'll kind of start by talking about what you saw with William. So um, when William was presenting, we kind of saw some of the potential pitfalls of the traditional manuscript process. Um, for example, William mentioned Daryl Bem kind of using the traditional manuscript process to prove that ESP is real. And we also heard a couple of the potential benefits of registered reports. So um, William briefly mentioned how they incentivize replications of previous studies, and also how, in some ways, they reduce the need for questionable research practices. Um, and we're going to dive into that a little bit more in this section. So as we're going through the section, you'll learn a bit about um, these questionable research practices that are sometimes used in research. Um, we'll talk about why these questionable research practices are used. And then we'll go into how registered reports prohibit or discourage the use of these practices before finally looking at the other side of the coin. So open science practices, which are kind of uh, the opposite of these questionable research practices and, and in some ways in which they're associated with registered reports as well. And so first and foremost, we'll talk about some questionable research practices um, used with, within research. And so I think to start things off, it's good to kind of provide a definition. And so in the widely cited article by John et al. in 2012, um, in kind of the area of open science, um, they kind of define questionable research practices as the steroids of scientific competition, artificially enhancing performance and producing a kind of arms race in which researchers who strictly play by the rules are at a competitive disadvantage. And so kind of removing the analogy and kind of providing a, a straightforward definition of QRPs, um, it can kind of be boiled down to this. There are practices that a researcher engages in to artificially or falsely enhance the appeal, impact, or publishability of their research results. And so now that we kind of provided this initial definition, I wonder if there are any practices that jump to your guys' heads um, when you hear that. Is there any questionable research practices that you guys can think of? And if not, it's totally fine. That's why we're here. Yeah. Uh, for, I mean, at the analysis, I think covariates or uh, like excluding participants. From... Yeah, exactly. That, that's a great one. We'll actually mention that one. That, that's great. But kind of like adding covariates or, or excluding individuals just to kind of manipulate the outcome of your statistical analysis. That's great. Any other ones that jump to mind? Okay, well, great. Well, we're going to dive into a couple. I'll define, there, there's many out there, but I'll, I'll de define some explicitly um, before kind of continuing on with their relationship with registered reports. And so the first one that I'll mention is um, p-hacking. And William mentioned the name, but we'll get into it a little bit more now. So in order to understand p-hacking, the first thing we need to do is understand a p-value, which I'm sure all of you have heard many times throughout your graduate school career. And I'm, I'm probably sure most of you have used them a lot as well in your own research, but um, just to include it in the presentation, definition of a p-value, the probability of obtaining a result at least as extreme as your result, assuming the null hypothesis is correct. And in many areas of research, this is particularly true in psychology, these um, p-values um, that were associated with the statistical test we've run are used to determine whether we can say that we have found evidence that an effect exists or not. And the most prominent p-value, um, at least in the psych sciences, is um, a cutoff of 0 0.05. And so if you get a p-value less than 0 0.05 on an effect that you're analyzing, you're able to say that that effect is statistically significant from zero. There, oh, we have evidence that this effect exists. And so now we can lead into, with the definition of p-values, what p-hacking is. And there's a lot of different ways that you can p-hack, but they all kind of result in the same end goal, which we'll see. So one way you can p-hack is by stop collecting data, particularly once you've reached a p-value of 0.05. Um, you can analyze a bunch of measures, but in your paper, only report those that um, reach that 0.05 threshold with the p-value. 
Um, you can collect and analyze many conditions, but only report those with a p-value less than 0 0.05. You can use covariates, as you mentioned, to get your p-value less than 0 0.05. You can exclude participants to get that p-value less than 0 0.05. And also, you can transform your data to get the p-value less than 0 0.05. And in all these different approaches to p-hacking, kind of the main goal or the, 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 the thing that makes it p-hacking is that these things that you're doing to change your analyses, they're motivated solely to get that p-value less than 0 0.05 to find a significant result. The goal isn't to find accurate findings or, or represent the world. It's just to get a significant finding. So another questionable research practice um, that William mentioned is HARKING, which is an acronym standing for hypothesizing after results are known. And so what that means is exactly how it sounds. Rather than forming your hypotheses ahead of time based in theory and like sound research, and then using those hypotheses and testing them using your statistical analyses, you kind of run your statistical analyses and then let the results of those statistical analyses determine the hypotheses that you want to find so that if you find like this result is significant in the statistical analyses, then like, oh, I'll form my hypothesis around that result. So it supports my hypothesis. So it's in a way flipping kind of the order in which we should be implementing these things in our studies. And it might not be as directly apparent why this is bad as p-hacking, but um, it can have some detrimental effects on the um, kind of accuracy or the soundness of the literature that exists. And so one issue is that it can lead to an increased type one error rate in the research that we do. And this is because rather than our hypotheses being based on previous research, sound theory, um, we, we put thought into the hypotheses, we're letting the results of our studies guide the hypotheses we make. And so if, if this one result that we found turns out to be significant, it's like, okay, I'm gonna base my entire hypothesis around this result. Then if that result is a false positive, then you kind of have this entire hypothesis that you structured um, your introduction around um, that's based on like this one result that could be um, just due to a, a false positive. And um, it, it's a shakier kind of um, hypothesis um, than if we go the other way around. And it can also lead to wasted resources on unsupported research. So if your article that uses Harkin gets published and you based, you know, one of your main hypotheses around this one significant result that you happen to find, and then later researchers see that and see that like, oh, this previous person investigated this, I'm interested in pursuing that avenue as well. And it turned out that was just a completely out there result that just happened to be significant. Then this can lead further researchers to look researchers to look down that same route to investigate that further and spend you know vast resources on trying to like flesh out that result that turned out to not be true in the first place. And so, kind of a third questionable research practice that you heard William mention, we'll get into a little bit more now, is publication bias. And publication bias occurs in general when the results found in published research systematically differ from the results of all studies conducted on a given topic. And publication bias can be brought about at several different levels and in different ways. So we'll talk about it a little bit longer. So um, publication bias kind of stems from or, or it surrounds this file drawer problem that we have in a lot of areas of research. Um, and the file drawer problem suggests that results not supporting the hypotheses of researchers often go no further than the researchers' file drawers. Or I guess in the computer age, a lot of times this goes no further than the desktop of their computer. And so if a lot of these um, like hypotheses that they've tested and run studies on um, aren't actually being ending up in the published literature, then we're only seeing one side of the coin. If we're only seeing the effects that were supported in the literature, we're missing all of these studies and all these investigations that took place that showed um, that there was no evidence for other effects, and hence the, the bias in the name publication bias. And this can happen at a lot of different levels, um, kind of the the end result of there being publication bias can happen according to different people in different levels within the publication paradigm. So it could be that authors are less likely to submit non-significant findings for publication. It could be that reviewers are less likely to recommend papers that have non-significant findings. And also it could be editors that are just less likely to accept papers that have non-significant findings. But um, regardless of where it happens, what level it happens at, the end result is a literature that doesn't accurately represent all of the studies that are being conducted in a particular area. So now that we've talked a little bit about how these questionable research practices can be bad, um, let's talk about why researchers engage in them. And William hinted at this a little bit in his slides as well. Well, p-hacking, parking, these questionable research practices, their end result is that they make the results of a study appear to support hypotheses. 
And through publication bias, journals are often more likely to publish those positive results. And so because of that, you're more likely to want to engage in those practices that give you a better chance of getting your results published due to what's commonly called as the publisher parish model in academia. And this publisher parish model of kind of research is the fact that like as publications increase, so does the attention to researchers and their institution, which can potentially lead to more funding and promotion. And so because of the funding that you have to do future research and also your promotion, like, like you working your way up through your career is dependent, so dependent on publishing, you're pressured to engage in these practices that kind of can enhance the chances of getting published in the first place. Um, there's a recent study in 2018 that found out of the research trainees that they interviewed, 62.8% um, of them reported that at least in some way, the results that they reported and the analyses they did were influenced by the pressure to publish. So it wasn't solely them driven by trying to find accurate results or results that accurately represent the world. It was them in some way influenced by this pressure of like, I need to get these things published. So we've established that questionable researchers are bad, questionable research practices are bad, and like we've kind of discussed why researchers in the traditional publication paradigm might be kind of pressured to do them. So how are registered reports, how do they discourage these questionable research practices? Well, it all comes back to kind of the um, timeline that William displayed for the publication process for traditional manuscripts and registered reports. And uh, in particular, the thing to focus on is where peer review takes place. So with the traditional manuscript process, peer review takes place after you've developed the idea, designed the study, collected and analyzed the data, and also written your report. After everything is done, then kind of your work is judged by peer reviewers. Whereas with registered reports, kind of that, that main peer review, that stage one peer review, takes place only after you've developed your idea and kind of laid out your plan for analyzing that idea. And so because of this, we can kind of see how these uh, different timelines uh, for the registered reports um, connect with these different questionable research practices. So peer review and acceptance takes place before results are known with registered reports. The only thing at that stage one review process that reviewers are kind of judging and analyzing is the idea that you want to investigate, so the actual topic that you're looking into, and also your idea or your plan for investigating that topic. The results are not known. And so because of that, the decision to publish cannot be based on the findings of your research. And this removes the pressure to find significant effects, doing things to find significant effects. And so because we're not kind of judging whether something should be published or not based on the significance, that removes this kind of publication bias, this innate publication bias in the publication paradigm, and also it removes the desire, the motivation to p-hack because it doesn't matter whether you find significant results or not. And then also your hypotheses and analysis plan are established before examining the data. So you are submitting this stage one manuscript to be judged by peer reviewers before you've examined the data. And also the peer reviewers are kind of judging the quality of your manuscript based on what you say you're going to do and the hypotheses you're going to investigate. And this removes the, um, the ability, these researcher degrees of freedom to kind of make changes to your hypotheses after looking at the data. And this kind of limits your ability to do this harking. You can't change your hypotheses after looking at the data because part of that initial manuscript that got judged and has kind of um, been seen by the reviewers and they're going to judge the final publication on whether you follow what you said you're going to do initially, initially um, it is embedded in the registered report process. And so that removes this ability to kind of hypothesize after results are known. And so kind of to have some um, empirical evidence to kind of support uh, initially these kind of like, you know, we, we've kind of logically gone through how registered reports limit or discourage these registered reports, but it's always nice to kind of see some empirical evidence out there to support what we're saying as well. Um, an article in 2021 compared 71 registered reports to 152 traditionally published articles. And in each one of these articles that they looked at, they um, examined the first hypothesis in the article and tried to determine whether that first hypothesis was supported by the evidence, by, by the, the findings of the article, or whether you, they had non-significant results and that first hypothesis was rejected by the results. And Sheila all found that about 44% of the registered reports they looked at had positive results, had results supporting the um, first hypothesis. Whereas the traditionally published articles they looked at, 96% um, had positive results. And so you can kind of see that the difference here, like the evidence that like publication bias is not as present in the registered report literature as in the traditionally published literature. 
So we spent a bit of time talking about kind of the, the uh, negative practices, questionable research practices that can kind of compromise the integrity of research. And so now we're going to jump into a little bit the other side of the coin. So kind of good practices that, that enhance um, um, the quality of research or the openness of research. And so again, I'm going to start with the definition of these practices. And so open science practices are practices a researcher engages in to increase the honesty and or transparency of the research that they did. And so exactly like I did for QRPs, I'm just going to open it up to you all. Is there any open science practices that come to mind off the bat that you can think of? Pre-registrations. Pre-registrations, that's a great one. We'll mention that. That's, that's a great one. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. That's another one we want you to do. Those are, those are great practices. So kind of pre-registration, which we'll define, and also kind of open data that, that's um, open to uh, any researcher who's kind of wanting to look into what you did. That's great. So um, jumping in, exactly. The, the first one that I'll mention is pre-registration. And for those who may not know, pre-registration is uh, documentation of the hypotheses, study design, and analysis plan before data collection and analysis. So in kind of an informal framework, this looks like um, the open science framework. Uh, you can kind of put uh, your um, introduction and methods section before you run your analyses up there so that everyone can see what you were going to do before you did it. And there's like kind of a timestamp on the page so people can see when it was uploaded. And basically that can help hold you accountable to what you originally said you were gonna do. Um, if, if after looking at the data, it in no way supports what you're going to do originally, if you kind of have this publicly accessible document that um, had the timestamp on it showing that, like I said on this date, I was going to do this thing, you're less likely to um, feel able to kind of change it post hoc. And so that can increase kind of the openness and transparency of the research done. And as was mentioned as well, open data and code, which is data and code that are used in a study and are made publicly available. So um, all of, even though in your paper itself, you're going to be describing what you did. Um, if you provide the kind of code that you use to actually analyze the data, people can see explicitly what you did, like get down to the, the brass tacks of it, see like this is the code that was actually implemented to get each of these numbers appearing in my manuscript. And that also kind of cuts through any ambiguities that may exist because you're writing a research article with words that has a, you know, a limited um, page limit or word limit, and people can see explicitly what you did and also the data that you did it on. And so, yeah, this allows others to see the data and how it was analyzed. And finally, a third kind of uh, open science practice that we'll mention here is replications, which many of you may know the definition, but just in case you don't, it's um, a study that follows the design of a previous study to see if the same conclusions are reached. And so uh, if you're kind of looking at the literature and then there's the study that has been done previously, you can look at the method section and be like, I'm going to try and execute my study exactly like these people executed their study. And I want to see whether the conclusions that they reached, the numbers they got are the same conclusions that I reached, trying to do exactly what they did. And conducting these replications can kind of increase our confidence in the findings in the published literature. So if you see one study published 30 years ago that claims this one finding, that evidence for that finding is a lot more shaky than if you have that single study and then five more studies that have been done more recently that all found the same result. So it's able to kind of solidify the bedrock that future research is based on. And so now kind of talking about the relationship between registered reports and these open science practices. Are, are there ways in which registered reports are either associated with these or encourage these? So first and foremost, the process of pre-registration is embedded into the registered report process. Um, this kind of stage one manuscript that goes under peer review is essentially a pre-registration of what you say you want to do later on. And now it's actually built into the judgment of whether your paper is going to be published or not. It's inherent in that process, that publication paradigm. And so right away, we kind of have pre-registration covered by the registered report process. Um, also, compared to traditionally published manuscripts, there's some recent empirical evidence that suggests that registered reports have more open data and code. So this Ogles et al. article, um, they investigated about 62 registered reports and about 200 traditional papers. And they found that about 58% of the registered reports that they looked at shared both the data and code that they used. And that's compared to about 13% of the traditional papers that they looked at. 
And then also um, there's this kind of preliminary evidence coming out recently that registered reports consist of a higher proportion of replication studies. So in this article by Shiel et al., um, about 58% of the registered reports they looked at conducted replications, were replications, and that's compared to only 3% of the traditional papers that they looked at. So a lot lower number of replications in the traditional paper literature. So again, we kind of have this association with open data and also this association with replications with um, the registered report process. And so kind of a summary of where we went in this previous section to kind of bring everything back together. We talked about how questionable research practices can threaten research quality and validity. We talked about how registered reports are designed to inhibit and discourage the use of some of these practices. And then we kind of talked about the other side of the coin, these open science practices that enhance research transparency. And also we talked about how registered reports integrate some of these um, open science practices in the publication pipeline and talking about pre-registration and also some evidence that's, that's emerging showing that there are even other open science practices that aren't inherent in the register report process that seem to be uh, more associated with the registered report body of literature than with the traditionally published articles um, literature out there. And so, yeah, kind of to conclude, are there any questions before we wrap up this section and get into Amanda's section? Yeah, um, this is more about the pressure to publish than it is the questionable practice, but I guess they're related. Yeah. Would you say that it's also a pressure to get citations? And relating to that, are the rep uh, the non significant findings less likely to be cited? Yeah, I think that's a great question, and it's a current concern that um, we've kind of talked about. Um, and yeah, it's exactly right. Like, not only do you want to publish, but you want your published article to be cited. And so you're right. In some ways, having an article that's been published that has non-significant findings might not be as of interest to future researchers, and so it might not get cited in that way. There is some preliminary evidence out there that registered reports are able to get citations through other means. Um, for example, because they're more likely to be posted as preprints and have this open data out there that other people can use, they're able to kind of make up for the lack of publications that may come from like having non-significant findings and able to kind of garner those uh, those citations from other means that like traditional papers aren't drawing on as heavily. And I think the preliminary of evidence out there, I think it's just a preprint at this point, um, but there is a study that looked at that and they didn't actually find any differences between the um, overall like citation rates of registered reports and traditional papers. Thank you. Yeah, great question. Awesome, well, thank you all. I think we have another 10 minute break built in. So about like 1.10, Amanda will jump into her final section. Thank you. So it's not like the same kind of thing. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. 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 I don't know.
Yeah, we were just talking about this. We were just talking about this right now. Because, yeah, you guys are going to give us a break for us. Yeah, we're just talking about the three language three organizing sections in the report and mm -hmm. switching them basically. I have an idea in my head, verbal idea, but we're going to be talking more about the evidence and research and the two ideas of course, is the first one. And then we're going to make sure we have the same. We can bring that in. It's instead of the same. So we need to know what this is going to be. Mm -hmm. So we're going to make sure 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 I'm not sure. Wait, I don't think you can, but I'm going to email you know, and put that. Arthur asked why National Design Firm is going to have to use these circuits. Oh, yeah. Why oh. so I was like, if it doesn't really have to. I can send that email to you. This is Are we still? Yeah, I think so. Hmm. What one was that on the outside? The plane? Oh, that's coming. They're all in the first one. I just thought about the plane to the I'm going to grab one of the There's none that are just plain. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't think it is a good one. I'll finish it out. I hope so. It's cheaper. Mm -hmm. I'm not there asking about my phone. It's literally cheaper to go this way. It's just as close as one. Yeah. So. New travel system. I'm in the port. Yeah, but this is I don't. I'm not a fan of the new system. But what's the new part? I'm not a fan. Doesn't even do that. I do like that there's an option, like especially for graduate students. I don't think the graduate students have a chance of getting the waste paper and work. But I don't like that now. Every student goes through that system, and they're like, no, no, you can't. Get ready for it. Are they going to say, well, they can't do it? They can. They can. They might not have international help. But the reason they can do it is. But I don't know. 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 Or that they'll book it, but they're not leaving. They're not still going to be there. Did that happen? Oh, that did happen. Did that happen to me for like? Well, they have moved there since last year. Yeah. Not under. I think they're still in the same thing as well. So that means South and the East, and you go through like I did so much back and forth. They can get it figured out. Like, mm -hmm. out. Mm -hmm. out. Mm -hmm. Just really, yeah. Academic, you know. Yeah. You got it for years. I thought they just do it all the South. Yeah. Someone did that. But I don't know that I've ever had a situation. I can imagine of all your stuff. And then, like, yeah. well, you booked your airbag visa, you can't run to the crowd. Like, yes, like, that would suck. Well, that was like, I like working through the hotel side, but I guess I'll be best to have a bunch of stuff. So I think that. Yeah. 
Or even this one that I heard that Yes. Uh, Yes. Uh, yeah. Not good. Good Why are we getting a puppy too? Mm -hmm. Is it a moment Mm-hmm. Okay. It's a moment Yeah. I really like that. Yeah. Is that a chocolate one? Yeah. I don't know. I'm sorry to come back. Uh, did, uh, my old office worked out with a bunch of British pickup. Only one side of one of them, but we did a few British pickup for the rest of the day. We had fun. to send that photo and put it on the bottom of 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 so we hadn't voted on the like, slate that people would have voted for the black. That was that was me just saying I don't want people to hold it against me. But it's just based on a picture? Yeah. Well, because we were in it was, it's a safe job. Yeah, right. It is not very perfect, but because it was like the hard to get it, it was a lot of fun. Yeah, but I want you to come. I want to start here for a couple of months. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I'll be mm -hmm. Just put that on your CV. I did it. Yeah. Star Maker. <laughs> I do have coal in there now. Like, what is that? Good. 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 I did that last time. Oh, terrible. Okay. Am I am I Mikey? Okay, I'm Mikey. I'm Amanda, not Mikey, but um, super. So for the last section, um, we're talking about kind of the practical advice. And one of the things that I want to point out here is that a lot of this is kind of just based on uh, my experience, our lab's experience, and not a lot, not as much like empirical evidence. Um, so uh, there are things that our lab is doing to uh, research some of these questions. So for example, we're uh, another side of this grant that we're doing um, is actually collecting data from authors who are doing registered reports to learn about things like citation rates and timelines, like how long does the stage one review process take? And does it take longer to do that than some other review process? So that's something that we're doing as a research team. Um, but in the process of all that, we're learning a lot about this process is more kind of just like qualitative. Um, I also serve as a handling editor at two different journals handling registered reports. And so I've learned a lot about that process through that. Um, and then our lab um, has done a number of these now. I think um, we have maybe four or five in various stages of, um, of this process. So um, in this section, we're gonna talk about a couple different things. So one thing that I wanna talk about specifically is advice about writing the stage one submission. This seems to be kind of the most foreign part of this process because you're writing before you ever have data and that is um, kind of unusual. Um, and so I wanna give some advice on, on what successful stage one submissions look like. We're going to talk about um, <clears throat> implementing registered reports as a principal investigator. So if you're running a lab, um, what this looks like from that side, but also as a trainee. And so the, the kind of issues that might come up, the barriers that exist um, are kind of different if you're a PI versus a trainee. So I'm going to talk about both of those things. Even if you're currently a trainee, it's still a good idea to think about what it's like to be a PI. 
um, because you might eventually become a PI or you want to do some perspective taking and thinking about what um, barriers your PI might be experiencing. The last thing I want to talk about is getting credit for registered reports. So um, uh, these things are still new and there's a lot of people who don't really know what they are. And so um, there's a little bit that you can do to kind of grease the wheels in order to make it clear to people that these are um, uh, of kind of a, a higher quality or, or um, uh, a, a different kind of product than necessarily a traditional paper. So we're going to talk about that when you're on the job market and then also in evaluation. Um, and I'm going to give some specific recommendations for dealing with UCLA specific policies. Um, and then the last thing that we'll talk about is how you can advocate for increased adoption of registered reports in your community. Um, as we've mentioned before, there are now a lot of journals, 400, that accept registered reports, um, but those have not been just like adopted across the board. Um, especially in psychology, they've increased a lot, and uh, specifically social psychology, it's become very popular. Um, but in other areas of psychology or even um, other fields, these are just now picking up. And so there's things that you, you can do to advocate um, uh, for this process. So I'm gonna start with writing advice for stage one. And again, a lot of this is not like empirically based. It's just um, you know, what uh, I've seen and done um, and kind of what I've learned. So um, there's two potential structures for a stage one proposal. Um, both of them start with an intro and a methods, and these should look exactly the same as you're used to writing an intro and methods. Um, there was a question earlier about what level of detail should you write your methods with, the same level of detail you write your methods with. By the end, the product should look exactly the same as kind of a traditional paper. Um, sometimes you end up providing a little bit more information in the methods just because of the uncertainty of how things are going to get implemented. But overall, you can kind of plan for the same. The thing that's different is um, this third part. So there's kind of two approaches that I think have been very successful. One is writing out a separate section that is a data analysis plan. Um, and uh, I'm going to talk about how you might decide between these two approaches. Um, but the data analysis plan is a description of what you plan to do um, uh, with your analysis. Alternatively, you can do a results section with blanks where you just write out your results section and you omit all of the numbers and the, the things. And I'll show, show you what these might look like. So the intro and methods should just look the same as a traditional manuscript. There's some, some elements that, that differ that I'll talk about. Um, <clears throat> but in general, in terms of like length, level of detail, stays the same. Um, typically, you cannot change your stage one sections during stage two. So one thing that um, is a little bit weird is that some journals allow you to make small changes like grammatical changes. Um, and so I think William showed a table of like, oh, when are you allowed to change your intro? Um, so those are like grammatical changes or like tense changes because your stage one might be written in future tense, like we're gonna do this. Um, but then stage two is like, we did this. So you might go through and change those kinds of things. But generally, you won't be able to add a new paragraph about this secret moderator that you found in your exploratory analysis or anything like that. Um, the animated choice. So my advice for the introduction. So um, your introduction should follow a similar structure to a traditional paper. This um, will probably look very similar to the way that you have been writing introductions. There's a couple things that might differ. One thing is you won't know the results of the study, and this will probably make you feel uncomfortable. If you're used to writing introductions after you've already done your analysis, this will probably make you feel uncomfortable. That's totally okay. This is a new thing. Um, the first time that I did this, I felt very uncomfortable um, because you're used to harking. And it's a small thing, but what it is is that we're used to knowing what the results are gonna be. And so we form the introduction so that the people who are reading the paper expect exactly what came out of the study. And that's a natural thing. That's even like in social psychology for years, there's this one paper about writing and social psychology, and that's exactly what it tells you to do. So you haven't been doing anything wrong this whole time. It's a very natural way to write an introduction, but that's just not gonna be an option. 
when you write your introduction for a registered report. And so it's okay to kind of sit with that feeling of this feels weird. I don't know what the results are. How do I set up this question? And so I want to convince you to set up your question in a slightly different way, which is you're selling the idea of the study to the reviewers and to your audience. And what I mean by that is that you're selling the importance of answering this question. And the way that you go about doing this might be kind of different from what you're used to doing. So when you're used to writing an introduction where you're driving the audience towards the answer that you found, you're saying, hey, it's obvious that this is what we're gonna find in the study. But that's risky when it's a registered report because you might find that, or you might find something totally different. And then your intro won't make any sense. And so instead, what you wanna do is actually write your introduction. Oh, I don't have my animations quite right. You wanna write your introduction to set up the possibilities. This is why we think this might result in, in result X, or it might result in result Y. And set up both sides of the argument. Because what you're trying to do is sell to the reviewers that this is an interesting and contentious question that the results of the study will provide new information to the field. And if you set up the study in a way that says, well, obviously X is gonna happen, then the reviewers are gonna say, then why do you need to do this study? So you're actually trying to sell the product in a different way where you're trying to set it up in a way that says, well, X might happen and Y might happen. And the implications are really interesting either way, but we wanna learn which of these is the truth. So now you're emphasizing the importance of the research question, and you don't know what the answer to that question is. So you want to set up a mystery. You want to make arguments for both sides. And honestly, I found this style of writing to be way better than writing a normal introduction. It feels freeing. It feels like exactly what you do as a scientist, which is to say, well, this is an interesting question to answer because it might go one way, it might go another. I want to know what the answer is. And so you get to bring your audience into that experience instead of driving them straight towards one answer, which I find to be a great experience. But it's weird and it's new. And the first time that you do it, it will feel, feel weird and new. And the second time that you do it, it will feel weird and new. Um, I find that this actually tends to be more similar to grant writing than to paper writing, because in a grant, you're also trying to convince people ahead of time that this is a worthwhile question to answer um, and that we don't already know the answer. So um, it is a similar kind of writing to writing that we do as academics, but depending on your career stage and kind of where you're at, grant writing might be something that you haven't done quite as much. My advice for the methods. So generally, again, similar to our traditional method sections, um, whatever that looks like in your field is a good kind of baseline to start with. But there are a couple deviations away from that that you might want to consider. So one is that you might include more contingency plans than you would normally in a traditional paper because you don't know what's going to happen exactly. Um, and so you might say, oh, if, you know, if things start to look this way, then we might, you know, recruit more participants or something like that. Um, so you might include contingency plans in the methods themselves. And one of the things that I'll talk about a little bit is that time lag between the stage one and, and when you actually get to run the study. Um, and so something that's worthwhile is to write as if someone else is going to do the study. And this has two benefits, I think. One, you forget, I forget at least, I won't say you forget because you might have a perfect memory, but I forget, I forget what I'm up to. And especially when you submit a stage one and then you work on something else for three months while it's under review, and then it comes back to you, you wanna have a lot of details about what you're planning on doing. And those could show up in the method section. The other thing that I think is very likely to happen in the future is for people to write, try to replicate registered reports and compare replication rates between registered reports and traditional papers. I think that's a very likely meta study that will happen in the future. 
And so you might want to write your method section like somebody is going to try to replicate your study because it's probably going to happen if you write a registered report. Um, and we want the replication rate to be really high. Um, so most journals are also going to require some kind of sample size justification. I want to point out that this does not necessarily mean that you need to do a power analysis the way that we typically talk about power analysis, which is to say, ah, oh, yes, I think that the effect size is going to be exactly 0.34. Yes, 3.4, that sounds about right. And um, G Power told me that this is the sample size I need for that. Um, there are a lot of different ways to go about sample size justification. So you can use power analysis. You can use arguments about resource limitations. So the, there was a question earlier about um, if I have grant funding that says that I get 200 people, it's a little bit of a catch-22 because you clearly wrote the grant and said you needed 200 people. But at whatever point you come into the registered report, you say, I only have money for 200 people. Um, and if that's the limitation, then you can say, I only have money for 200 people. Given that I have 200 people, this is the effect size that I am well powered for. And that's called an effect size sensitivity analysis. And it really is just a power analysis with different inputs and a different output, where instead of putting an effect size in and, and then getting a sample size, you put a sample size in and you get an effect size. But the equation is the same. Uh -oh. Okay, so um, you might be asking, should I write a data analysis plan or should I write a blank results section? Um, so the data analysis plan will get published with the final paper. And so it is like a section in the paper that doesn't change. Um, it won't just disappear at the stage two, it'll stay in the paper. And that's worth considering if, for example, journals have very specific word limits. Um, so, uh, one of the papers that I was involved with, we very, like the, the final paper, I think was 7,000 words. So short in my field, at least. Um, so we didn't feel like we could have a data analysis section because that just eats up your words. Um, so, uh, so thinking about that aspect of this is going to get published with the final paper. Um, one of the things that I found is that it's more likely or it's easier to skip some steps or not fully think through all of your analysis when you write it this way versus writing a blank result section. Because you might say that you're going to do X, Y, Z, and Q and forget that those things rely on certain statistical assumptions. And you might want to check those assumptions before you do those analyses. But then once you have the data, then you check them and you're like, oh, I didn't put that in my analysis plan. What do I do? Well, you say that you checked it. That's what you do. Um, but I think personally, I find it easier to make sure that I've covered all of my steps doing the blank results as compared to data analysis plan. It could be a good idea though, if you have a lot of contingencies. So for example, if you do like multi-level modeling or structural equation modeling, where there are di different decision points in your analysis process, then it's easier to kind of describe those in a data analysis plan than like pre-write your results section in like eight different ways because, oh, if it comes out this way, then we'll do this. If it comes out this way, then we'll do that. And then the paragraph totally changes. So um, if you have a lot of contingencies in your analysis plan, it might be easier to write it in a plan than do a lot of like results. Regardless, I think it is a very good idea to make some fake tables and figures and think in advance about how you're going to take your data and make it into tables and figures. And in fact, for some stage one submissions, we said we generated some fake data and here's like an example of a figure that we'll make. For blank results, um, the blank results section will not show up in the final manuscript. Instead, you will fill in the numbers and then that will show up. Um, and so it will get updated and then filled in. Um, this process, I feel like, is pretty formulaic and it's kind of nice. Once you have the data, you just like, it's like a mad lib. You know, you're just filling in all of the numbers and it's like, I don't know, soothing. Um, I've even, if any of you are familiar with Markdown or Corto, um, you can actually pre write your results section with those programs. And then once you have the data, just like fill in the numbers. 
Um, and so for some registered reports that I've been involved in, that's what we did um, is we pre-wrote everything in a markdown file. And then once we got the data, we just ported it in and did the analysis, which is pretty great. Feels good. Um, if you have a lot of contingencies, then like writing a blank result section might feel pretty tedious and you might have whole sections that you like cut out in the, in the final results. And that might feel like you're kind of doing a lot of work that maybe never ends up seeing the light of day. And so it might not be the best choice. Um, regardless as well, make big tables and figures for either one. Um, it's a really good practice. Um, I want to show you what these might look like. So on the left here is an example from a uh, uh, published registered report um, with myself and uh, my colleague, John Tawa. And here we did a data analysis plan. Um, and so we had this uh, reg registered data analysis plan section in the paper, and we kind of just verbally described what we were going to do. We said, oh, we're going to check normality and homogeneity of variance. Um, and if there are problems, we'll do transformations. One thing that I will say is that we did not provide enough detail in how we were going to do that. Um, so I've actually subsequently asked my research assistants in the lab to try to replicate the study using the stage one submission. Vast, vast different um, ways that everybody went about doing this because there's multiple tests of normality and multiple tests of homogeneity of variance. But we didn't say which one we would use. Um, so this is, again, I think an example of how writing a data analysis section might not necessarily provide as much detail as you think that you're giving um, in terms of reducing your researcher degrees of freedom and different choices that you might have upon actually getting the data. Um, but generally, we kind of walk through. And um, in this paper, and it, I would recommend in any registered report, you should have specific hypotheses that you lay out. And you can say very specifically, you know, we're going to test hypothesis 1A and 1B um, using a two by three analysis of variance on each outcome. So two different outcomes in this in this paper where we had two different outcome variables, same analysis, different outcomes. Um, and then we'll use a specific contrast. So you want to map on a specific analysis to a specific hypothesis. And in the end, you really want a um, a specific parameter in that analysis to align with your specific hypothesis. So here this says a significant contrast would provide support for hypothesis one only if this mean is significantly higher than that mean. So you really want to kind of narrow in on like not just I'm going to fit a regression, but like which coefficient in the regression needs to be significant for you to claim support for your hypothesis. Um, you can actually find a lot of examples of these. Most registered reports have to go onto this OSF registry page, and um, they all have this data analysis section. So uh, it's really easy to see a lot of examples like this. Um, the less common one, but I actually think maybe the better one, um, is doing a blank results section. And so here's an example. This comes actually from the Mini Labs 5 study. If you're not familiar, the many lab studies are some of these like big replication attempts or studies that do um, the same study across many different labs. Um, and many labs five was done as a registered report. And you can see what they did is they just wrote their results section and then left numbers blank. Um, and so you can see like this is a regression coefficient results section. The thing that I think is really cool um, that is quite useful is you can think in advance about what language you're going to use to describe the results. And so you might say this model did or did not converge. So we did a bunch of different things. And you can build in those contingencies in what you write out and submit in the stage one submission. Um, and I think that that is really helpful to make sure that you're thinking through all the possible contingencies, because if you read these sentences and you realize like, oh, we don't know actually yet if, if this model is going to converge, and so we need to have a plan for if this model does not converge. Um, and so, so you can actually describe this in your text that you submit for your stage one. I think it's very transparent to your reviewers. Um, yeah, I think those are the things that I wanted to say about that. 
here, here's, I think, a nice example where this isn't, well, this is more for a multi-level model, but they talk about like a heterogeneity test and then the specific statistics that they're going to report along with it. So it's very clear what you would do, whereas in the data analysis plan that I showed you that was mine, I wrote that, um, uh, I didn't specify which statistic I was going to use or what alpha level or anything like that. And so it's, I think, um, this process forces you to really, really go through all of your different steps. Um, some general recommendations for this section, um, align your analyses with listed hypotheses. So somewhere in your introduction section, usually near the end in psychology, there's like a hypothesis section and you might number them or do something where you can map from hypothesis to analysis. Um, if there's only one hypothesis, then it's one analysis, and that's very straightforward. But a lot of the time, at least in psychology, we have a bunch of different hypotheses that we're testing in the same data. Um, so provide that list in the introduction section, and then each part of the analysis plan should align with a specific hypothesis. Again, even getting down to the what specific parameter, what is the test statistic you're going to use, um, and what alpha level are you going to use. If you're doing null hypothesis significance testing, if you're doing some kind of Bayesian approach, then you might say, oh, I'm going to use the uh, highest density interval versus the Bayesian credible interval. Those are two different choices that you can make. Um, so even in a Bayesian approach, you might still have different things that you would need to specify. Um, and you can be very specific about this, where you might say hypothesis one will be supported if this specific test statistic for this specific parameter is greater than or less than a specific threshold. Um, so you want to be very specific about that. I highly recommend if this is within your skill set, and I'll talk about a couple different ways that you could do this to generate some fake data and analyze it, because there's just something about having something real in front of you that makes you realize when you plan something that was entirely impossible. Um, and I've made this mistake of not doing this for one of our registered reports, and it caused a lot of problems. Ultimately, the paper still got published, nothing really, not actually problems in terms of the publication process, but just like, I planned to do analyses that were impossible, and nobody caught it in the peer review process. So, um, so that just like added more stress in stage two. But if you generate some data and you analyze it, you can make sure that all of your analyses are possible, especially if you're a Markdown Porto user. This is actually a really like nice process. Um, one way that you can do this is if you do any amount of piloting, which I would highly recommend doing for anything that you want to do as a registered report, um, do a, a small pilot just to make sure your recruitment process is like feasible, your data collection makes sense. Um, and then you can just like copy paste the data make it as big as you plan on making it because this isn't your real data. This isn't p-hacking. It's just checking that things will kind of work. Um, so do this to get up to your goal sample size. I actually did this one time without doing that. And it like I had convergence problems in the models because the sample size was so small. So I, then I figured out to make it bigger by just copying it. Um, so that I think is a good plan. Or if it's within your skill set, you can simulate data. Um, and this could even be so simple as if you're, I, I know a lot of people here are in psychology, I mean, talking to psychology people, but um, you could even have the RAs in your lab do the pilot, right? It doesn't matter. Their data isn't, in, you know, what they actually say isn't important. But if you're using some kind of like survey software, you want to make sure that the input of the data is the way that it will come out of the survey software. Um, and so as close as you can, um, uh, uh, Kind of replicating that data collection process. Simulating data, you could do similarly, but then especially if you simulate data, you want to make sure that it's coming out in the form that it will come out of the um, survey software. So for example, if you're using Qualtrics and Qualtrics spits out the results as like ethnicity, it says like here's five different boxes, then you want to make sure that the data that you generate looks like that um, so that all of your code runs. And you can pre-write your analysis script, and you can even include that as part of your stage one submission um, and your pre-registration. So it would be like extra supplemental materials in your um, stage one submission. I found this to be very helpful because reviewers often have like really specific questions about how you're going to do data analysis, and then they can just look at your code. 
Um, and if you include it in a pre-registration and external pre-registration, then other people can know that your code was pre-written for your analysis. Um, and it's and it's fine if you have to make changes. You know, if, if it turns out that nobody checked the American Indian box, and so you had to slightly change the analysis related to racial categories, like the, that's fine. It's about transparency of what was the plan and then how was it in. Things that people, me, frequently forget. Um, so one is thinking about measurement assessments. So if you do any kind of research where um, the data that comes out needs to be processed. So if you do any kind of brain imaging or you do research with scales, you want to think about how you would assess that scale before doing any kind of combination, like taking the mean of the items, or, or are you going to do a factor analysis? What are you going to do? And if the performance of the scale is poor, what are you going to do? Um, so frequently in social psychology, we'll use multi-item scales and we'll check reliability. If you check Cohen or Chromebacks Alpha and it's 0.4, you might want to do something about that. Um, and so putting in the measurement assessment into your analysis plan is a really important step that a lot of people forget. I forget. Um, think about what you would do if a measure isn't reliable, what your threshold for reliable is, right? Whatever that means. Um, and especially for folks who do any kind of brain imaging. Um, I know that there are like quality tests that people look at. And so you might um, try to explain what that is um, a priori. Another thing to think about is missing data. So what happens if you have missing data? Um, missing data is often very hard to predict um, that it's going to happen. Otherwise, it just wouldn't happen. Um, so you want to explain how you would handle missing data. Maybe if there are different forms of missing data that might occur. Um, we have one registered report where that's under data collection now where we said, okay, if Participants don't answer more than 25% of the questions will sample a new participant um, because you can pre-register whatever you want and then implement it as part of your plan and then it doesn't look sketchy, right? Because that would look really sketchy um, if it was just something that we said, oh, we saw there's, you know, 10 people had not very much data and so we just got 10 more people. That looks weird if it's not pre-registered. Um, think in advance about your exclusion criteria, what might make you exclude a participant, so especially if there's any kind of like performance measure, like they're doing some kind of task and you need them to be a certain amount accurate to include them in the study, you definitely want to include that. Any kind of post hoc comparison, so especially if you do some kind of ANOVA, a significant interaction isn't always clear whether that's supporting your hypothesis or not. And so there might be follow-up analyses that you do some kind of pairwise comparison or something like that. Um, and then things about checking assumptions. So especially if you do any kind of statistical modeling, there are often assumptions that are involved in those, what assumptions there are, what, how you will check them, what specific criteria you will use for that. Um, and then also your alpha level. So um, you have the freedom in a registered report to choose what your alpha level is. If you don't say anything, then probably in psychology, people will assume it's 0.05. Um, but you should be very explicit. And you could even use different alpha levels for different analyses if you had some kind of rationale for that. Um, but that's kind of the glory of pre-registration uh, is that you get to decide. Um, there's this really lovely paper that I just found. <laughs> Um, it just came out really recently um, by Henderson and Chambers uh, called 10 Simple Rules for Writing a Registered Report. So I highly, highly recommend um, that you read this. Uh, a, a lot of this actually kind of aligns with what we talk about here. Um, so the first rule is learn on the job, which is to say um, the first time you do a registered report, it's going to be different and weird and confusing, and that's normal and it's okay and you're learning on the job. This is a new thing, and so be accepting of yourself in the process. Um, the second is to develop an empirically valid question and a sound feasible study design that can answer that question. So one of the, um, actually as an editor, I've seen this most often, is that people feel like they have to say that they're going to do the most amazing thing as a registered report, 
And then it becomes a problem when they actually try to do it and they don't have the funding for it or they don't have you know, the resources. Um, so you wanna make sure that you're proposing something that you can actually do and that that study is aligned with the research question because that's going to be the core thing that um, peer reviewers are evaluating. Um, select your journal or don't, meaning use PCIRR. But even if you are planning on using PCIRR, you want to look at the, the friendly journals and see, you know, if you, if you want to publish with a journal, you want to make sure that they're friendly with some journals that you want to publish in. Um, so one of my graduate students is going through PCIRR, um, and she identified three journals that are friendly with them um, prior to submitting. Um, so you want to know what the journal requirements are and keep those in mind while you're planning your study. This might weigh into whether you would do a data analysis plan versus like results, especially if the word limits are very short, um, and especially any of the policies around like secondary data, that kind of thing. Um, consider when to apply for ethics. So if you do human subjects research, you need to also get IRB approval. And a lot of journals um, that uh, accept registered reports they will want proof of IRB approval before they will give you an in-principle acceptance. So there's kind of a like in, informal acceptance letter that you get from the journal. This is, hey, we want to give you an in-principle acceptance, but we need um, you know, proof of funding and proof of, um, of IRB approval. And so you might not necessarily want to wait until you get that email to apply for IRB approval, depending on how fast your IRB is, I think our IRBs here are actually pretty fast, but maybe they're not, I don't know. Um, uh, so generally what we've done on our team is to apply for ethics around the same time as a stage one submission, or if we need to do piloting, then we obviously have to submit earlier than that. Um, but it's easier usually to just make a small revision to a study um, than to just start out from scratch um, with your IRB approval upon um, kind of informal in principle acceptance. Um, map from your research question through to your interpretation. So thinking through your research questions in the intro, what that looks like in your methods, what that looks like in your results, and what that looks like in your discussion. Um, some stage one submissions will even include kind of like language that they might include in their discussion depending on how results look. So that um, many labs by people actually have like a pre-written discussion section, which is pretty cool. Um, and then specify what you will do and what you won't do. Um, so if there are any like doors that you want to close for yourself in terms of flexibility, you can specifically say that you will not um, try every pairwise comparison in your three by two ANOVA design. Um, you can you can say what you will do and what you want to do. Um, it's recommended to pre-register your stage one manuscript, usually like upon in principle acceptance, um, so that there is like a separate record outside of the journal um, that is your stage one submission. This is really important um, because not all journals make those stage one submissions publicly available. And um, uh, there is some kind of meta research being done looking at comparing stage one submissions to stage two submissions, that kind of thing. And so um, it's helpful to have that. And you have your own kind of independent, your version of the um, pre registration. After stage one approval, manage any deviations from your stage one manuscript and communicate with your editor. So if there are big, big things that need to change about the way that you're doing your study, you need to communicate that with the editor. So some examples, um, the paper with John Tawa, we were doing data collection. It was going very slowly. It was for a special issue that had a deadline. Um, and so we decided to collect participants from UCLA as well as John's institution, Mount Holyoke. Um, so we contacted the editor. We said, hey, this is how many people we have so far. We're trying our darndest to get all of these people. We can't. We have this collaborator who's at UCLA who has a more accessible student population. Um, is it okay if we run the study there too? And the editor was like, yeah, sure. Just make sure that it's clear in the manuscript. Um, so that you can deviate from your stage one submission. It just has to show up in the manuscript and make it clear that that was not what you intended from the beginning. Instead, you had to make a change in the middle, which is like normal. 
Um, I don't think I've seen any registered reports that didn't report any deviations. Like stuff, life happens. It's normal. There are small things too that like, um, especially if it's not something that directly conflicts with your stage one submission, but instead like a decision that you had to make kind of in the moment, um, you can also record those. So um, Tristan has been leading data collection for a registered report. And uh, in a lot of our meetings, I find myself saying, oh, make sure you write that down, that like that was the decision that we made. Um, so that when you get to the stage two, you might have a section that is kind of, you know, decisions that we made along, along the way. Um, nine, prep your stage two manuscripts so you can pre-write things um, as you're going. It's a way better process than trying to write it all at the end. Um, and then last, uh, make your stage one registered report and study assets open. So data, code, everything that you can, make it as open as you, you know, ethically can. So those are the 10 simple rules. Um, I want to talk about registered reports as a PI. I'm curious, is anyone here PI, call himself a PI, in charge of people? Supervising other people. Okay, I'll go through this quickly. It's not as in, it is important, I think, for you guys here. So, um, does anyone see any potential barriers as a PI to doing registered reports? Jared? I feel like there might be a high barrier for like what knowledge you think you need to have. So, like, if I'm, you know, know that I should be doing a multi level model. But right, I don't know what I should do, or even I might not even think about convergence issues, things like that. Yeah. So feeling like I don't know that I can write something specific enough that would kind of count as a registered report. Yeah. Are there barriers? Let's see. We'll talk about them. So one question that you might ask, especially if you manage lots of people, is should I jump right in or just dip my toe? Should I say, my lab is all registered reports all the time from now on because you run a lab? Or do you say, I'm going to try a registered report for one project and see how it goes? And generally, my recommendation is to dip your toe because you're going to learn a lot when you do that, and it's going to make the subsequent iterations easier. So you might eventually decide everything in my lab is a registered report all the time, but what you'll find is that if you're dealing with all of the problems that occur for a stage one for multiple projects all at the same time, then you're having to learn the same lesson many times versus taking what you applied the first time and applying it the next time. That's my general recommendation. You'll learn a lot with each iteration. So start with a project that you think this would make a really good registered report. Start with that project and then go from there. Um, be patient with yourself and your team as you learn something new. So if you're a PI and this is your first registered report, it's probably your trainee's first registered report. And so having some kind of forgiveness and acceptance of this is not going to go perfectly the first time. Um, that paper that I showed you, like I've learned a lot from that paper. It did not go perfectly. It was fine. Um, but it was that I think was the first stage one submission that I wrote. Um, and I've learned a lot. Um, get an in principle acceptance for starting another stage one. So I wouldn't recommend starting multiple stage one proposals before you've gone through the full peer review process. So kind of figuring out, okay, if I'm just gonna dip my toe, then when am I allowed to start the next one? I would say after you have an in principle acceptance, then it's okay to maybe start another one. Um, because you learn a lot in that full process, but you really wanna go through the full peer review process before you um, start something new. If you can, if it's possible, work with somebody who's done a registered report before. Um, and even if it's like there's somebody in your field who did a registered report, maybe their expertise is not in this specific area, they're bringing expertise of doing a registered report. And so it might be worthwhile to reach out to them and say, hey, like I'm working on a registered report. I know this is a little bit far afield for you, but I'd love your perspective and we'd love to have you as eighth author, whatever, um, you know, br bring them on. Um, reach out to journals that publish registered reports and ask to be a reviewer because the experience as a reviewer can help you learn a lot about what this process is like. You can see how other people do it. And if you haven't done this already, try pre-registration first. 
Um, so pre-registering is like registered reports light. Um, and you'll find that the first time that you do a pre-registration, you don't specify a lot of different things. And that's just what happens. And it's kind of an internal system. Registered reports is external. And so try internal before it. Um, one of the hardest things with registered reports is time management. Um, there's more work up front for the planning. Um, and this feels awkward and it feels like you're going slow, but it's really just that the time is shifting. Um, William showed that. <laughs> awful figure. The figure is not awful, but the experience is awful. And it's a real one where you have to shop around journals, you have to run new studies, you have to do all this stuff. It's like a two-year process from first, first submission to final publication. Um, a lot of that time is front-loaded for registered reports. Um, plan time to write, revise, write and revise your intro methods and analysis plan or results. So when you're thinking about, you know, timing out things, which as a PI, that's all often what you do with your trainees, is work through, you know, when do we want to submit by? Um, you have to think about there's still writing involved. It's not a full manuscript, but there's still a lot of, this is most, most of your paper. The only thing that's missing is the discussion section. Um, Plan for typical review period. So in my experience as a reviewer and an editor, I think that the review period is pretty similar for a stage one registered report in a traditional paper. The thing that's different is that weird time in between when um, the reviewer asks for a new study and then you have to go run a new study. That's gone because you don't have to run an extra study. You don't have to throw away data. Um, so in terms of how long, like in my field, I think three to four months is typical for a review. And I think that that's true for registered reports as well. Um, typical number of revisions. So in my field, maybe two or three major revisions at a specific journal, that's very common. Um, be ready to run the study right away when you're in principle accepted yes. and received. And bless you. Um, uh, I have a hard time explaining this, but you develop over time like a spidey sense for when you're going to get reviews back and when I don't have ESP, just to be clear. Um, literally this week though, I messaged one of my students and I was like, Hey, did you get proofs back on that paper? And then like, she was like, no, should I write to them? And then an hour later she got them. Um, so you develop as you do this a lot, a spidey sense for kind of what's that Am I going to get another major revision on this paper, or do I think the next thing to come is an acceptance? And when you're in that mindset of, I think the next thing to come is an acceptance, then you want to start ramping up, training RAs, getting the study ready to run. Um, stage two review is typically pretty short, like one round. Um, and if the editor is good, it'll be one, one round, like with the reviewers, and then maybe the editor might have a couple small things. Um, but I, in my experience, I've never sent a stage two out to peer reviewers twice. Never done that. Mostly they write back and they're like, wow, this is amazing. I'm so excited that the study is done. Great job. Um, it's very nice. Um, just to give a little bit of data, we don't have a lot of data. We're working on it. But there is this um, study from 2018 that did look at time, time points, what they could get. So in principle acceptance to publication, the median from this study was uh, 761 days. So this includes the amount of time it takes to run the study and then go through the stage two review, which is not a very useful statistic, but that's what we have. Um, stage two submission to publication was about half a year. And these were mostly in journals where publication is like in print. Um, so that's what we have data on now. Our lab is trying to get better data in terms of the review process and how long things take, but that's what we know so far. Um, one of the most common questions that I get is, what should I do while I'm waiting, right? Because you do this whole thing, it's like a sprint, and then you just stop when you do the stage one submission. And you're like, ah, I have all of the materials. I have everything ready to go. I have code. I, have, I just want to collect the data. Um, it feels really weird. Um, to just stop. And so it's hard to think about what you be doing while you wait. So my general recommendation is between first and second submission, you should be doing things like piloting your materials, if you, especially if you didn't get a chance to before your stage one submission. Um, at least in my field, nothing ever gets accepted the first round. 
So you're probably going to get a major revision anyway. Um, and so this could be a good time to collect a little bit of pilot data to make sure that your um, you know, projected response rates are what you think that they're going to be um, and those kinds of things. I actually recently, as an editor, asked um, uh, some study authors to do a pilot because they were sampling from a pretty rare population. And so it's like a limited number of people that they could sample. And I was concerned that they're just not going to get up to the sample size that they want. So I said, could you do a small pilot with 20 people and then report what your response rate was for the study invitation so that we know that your sample size is feasible? Um, check your data collection process. So this could be a time when you have the RAs, do the study a couple of times, just fill out, fill out the survey, just click buttons, do whatever. Um, and then you can have some big data. Double check your analysis scripts and document your processes. So especially as a PI, you might have turnover in your staff in between when you plan the study and when you actually plan to run it. So um, making sure that there's documentation of all of the different steps that you're going to need to do so that new people can come in and take on the study whenever it's ready to go. After your second submission, you can continue to pilot if there were major changes. So if there was something that in the revision that really changed like what you were going to do, you might do a new pilot um, or you work on other projects. That's the kind of the point at which I say, okay, just let it sit. But you want to make sure that everything is documented in a way that you can just let it sit and you're not going to pick it up and go, oh my gosh, I have no idea what I was doing. What are we even supposed to do for this study? Um, you'll feel like that regardless when the day of in-principle acceptance comes, you'll be like, oh my god, I totally forgot about that study. I have no idea how it works, um, but it can happen. So one of the things I think is trickiest, at least from a PI perspective, is handling staff turnover. So when you're um, working with short contract employees or undergraduate research assistants or even master students, um, there can be a lot of turnover that happens in between when you get, uh, when you are planning a study versus when you're running it. Um, so plan to have different people. Just assume that that's going to happen. Don't let any one research assistant hold all of the knowledge about the study in their head. Make them write it down um, because otherwise you will not know how to do this. So don't rely on continuity um, and develop a documentation and training system that allows new employees to join partway through. Um, so this could be as simple as every new research assistant gets trained on common tasks that you do in the lab. So um, uh, if you do the IAT, or like if you do certain things that RAs are going to have to do in a lot of different studies, you could just train them on those from the get-go. And having general lab protocols can help with just onboarding new employees. So again, if there's common things across many studies that you want to do. Um, Registered, and this is like just good advice generally, but it's very specific to registered reports and some of the problems that can occur. Um, one thing that's tricky is deciding about time sensitive studies. So, um, uh, if you have a study that needs to run at a specific point in time for a specific reason, um, they're a little bit trickier to manage as a registered report. So, um, in general, if you have studies that need to be run at a specific time, like say you collaborate with a company and you want to document their onboarding process and they hire 50 new employees that start on June 2023, you might not have time to submit a registered report and go through the revision process before data collection needs to start. Um, and that's totally okay. And I think it's totally fine to have studies that aren't registered reports. Um, that's just going to be kind of natural. Um, so, for example, if you have education studies that have to align with a specific school year, that might just not work as a registered report. Um, studies that need to be completed by the end of a grant, put a little asterisk, I'll come back to that. So, if you're trying to rush through something because you're within the granting period and you just can't wait for a stage one uh, peer review process, then you don't have to do it as a registered report. Um, I'm working on a study, it's an interleaving study where we're actually implementing an intervention in nine different classrooms on the UCLA campus um, for spring quarter. Um, so we had originally planned to do that as a registered report. We started planning this last summer, um, but we got to a point where we were like, oh, we don't have enough time between when we were ready to run the study and then 
when uh, when we needed to start running it to like go through a full review process. So we pre-registered the study and now we're gonna do data collection. It's totally fine. Um, as you get more experience with registered reports, you can improve your timing. So um, that team actually came to me originally and they were just like, hey, I know you don't know anything about interleaving, but would you like to help with a registered report? And I was like, yeah, that sounds great and complicated. Um, and it was kind of me on the team who was like, I don't think we have time for a registered report now. Um, so the whole reason I'm there is <laughs> it's also complex analysis and, and other things that I'm doing. But I think like as you get more experience with these things, you'll figure out when you can and cannot do a registered report. But I wouldn't recommend starting with something that's really time sensitive because it will just stress you out. Um, PCIRR offers scheduled reviews, which can help with timing concerns. So um, one of my graduate students is trying to do her dissertation as a registered report. And so, um, so she has a scheduled review so that it's like, okay, now that she's done her dissertation proposal, we scheduled the stage one submission to be, you know, a few months in the future for, um, you know, revisions based on the proposal. And, um, but it will kind of keep her within the traditional timeline so that she can do her dissertation and still graduate on time. And so, forth. so that's nice. Um, the thing that I will say about grants um, is that sometimes having an in principle acceptance at the end of a grant might look better than just having a paper that's like in prep or under data collection. And so it could actually be that having a registered report at the end of a grant might look even better to the granting agency because it's already accepted at the journal. So they might be more willing to give you an extension on the budget or something like that if it's already accepted. Um, integrating with the grants process. So submitting pilot studies to a journal um, to have an in-principle acceptance by the time you submit a grant is a really good way to get them. Because what it means is that it's the journal has already decided that this study is worth doing. And so your granting agency is also likely to decide that the study is also worth doing. Um, so you're demonstrating that it's publishable and that there's broad interest. Um, registered reports with in-principle acceptances can be reported on status reports. Um, so if you have funding from like NIH or NSF every year, you have to send a status report. The first year feels the worst because you're like, I have done nothing. Nothing has happened. I got nothing done. Let me keep my money. Um, so having an in-principle acceptance is a really nice thing that you can do within the first year of a granting period. Um, and it's nice to report on the status report to say, we've submitted the proposal. Um, we have an in-principle acceptance at this specific journal and we're under, you know, we're doing data. So that feels good. Um, it's good early on for your first year report, and it can be good if you're a little bit behind also at the end of a grant, um, because in my experience, an in-principle acceptance is better than just a paper that's like in prep, which almost means nothing. Um, incorporating trainees. So um, when you have short-term trainees, so undergrads and master's students, it might feel difficult to incorporate them onto registered reports because they might not be here the whole time. And so a strategy that I think is really effective is to stack projects. And what I mean by this is that if you have a specific project, um, you have one trainee help with the stage one and then a different trainee help with the stage two. Unless the same trainee is there, then they can continue on with the same project. But plan for different trainees to be helping with different stages. The other thing that's nice is if you can, if you have your, your You've jumped all the way in, everything's a registered report in your lab, that's kind of how I am now. Um, uh, I actually think it's better for trainees to start with a stage two because there's a plan in place and they get to implement that plan and do, you know, write the results section, write the discussion, they're, they're integrated, they learn, and then they know how to write a plan because they have tried to implement a plan. And so it's easier, I think, if they have already tried to implement a plan for them to write a better plan. Um, and so that kind of leads to a little bit of learning. So plan one project, implement another project. Um, if they're still around, obviously they can stay on the project. Um, the only thing that I would think 
that I think is really important to note about this is that it's very important to have clear policies about authorship in your lab. Um, because if you have one trainee that made a plan and a different trainee that implemented the plan, they might both feel like they own that plan and they did the most work on that study. And so you need to have very clear policies within your lab about how authorship is dealt with in those um, contexts. Um, another aspect of the PI is allocating resources. So something that I find is that high quality studies are expensive. Um, that might mean that they cost a lot of money or they cost a lot of time or they cost a lot of people. Um, the uh, study with John Tawa, we had to have four research assistants logged in at the same time to run one participant. And it was insane. Jared was there. Um, it was a lot. It was like a very expensive study to run, and we only did it because it was a registered report. Um, so registered reports can help you allocate resources to sure things rather than risks. Because if you're thinking about running a study, but oh my God, if it doesn't work, then I've wasted a bunch of money and it won't get published. That's not a good way to like go about life. Um, and so I find it's very helpful to have registered reports where I'm, I know I'm investing in something that is going to result in a publication. Um, similarly, on, or on kind of the flip side, we might be unwilling to allocate resources to run a high quality study if we don't know that it's going to get published. And this is very common, especially when I talk to early assistant professors who are thinking about how to allocate their startup funds. Um, sure thing, better than risk. Right, and so this is a nice way to run high quality stuff from the beginning, rather than um, throwing little resources at a bunch of different seeds and hoping something grows. Yeah. I guess uh, this is uh, one of the difference between proposal and uh, registered report. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> In proposals, you have the provision of risks, and. Uh, you can take different paths uh, about this. Whereas here, it is more like uh, you know what you are going to do when you are not considering many of this. Yeah. So you, you, do you mean grant proposals? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So with a grant proposal, you're asking for the money. Um, in some fields, like the amount of money that you need for a specific project can kind of vary. Um, here, for a grant proposal, you're asking for the, the funds to do the thing. Here, it's about how you allocate those funds out. And so you might have a grant, but there's, you know, maybe studies one through three in the grant, and three is very risky, and so you might not allocate as much money to study three as you wish that you could. Um, and so submitting it as a registered report would be a nice way to make sure that you're putting your money into the things that that actually will produce a paper. Yeah. Um, so when we act as risk averse people in this context, we're reducing the quality of our science because we could be putting putting resources into finding learning something about the world, um, but we choose not to or we run kind of a subpar study because we're risk averse. I see the, the mark thing. Um, any other concerns that come up as thinking about as a PI or somebody running a lab or managing people? I got them all. Great. <laughs> okay, let's talk about being a trainee in this context. Um, and I want to start out, uh, or sorry, yeah. Um, what barriers do you all see? In, I think most of you are trainees, right? So what barriers do you see to doing this? With your next study, the next thing you have in the pipeline, could you just do this as a registered report? What barriers do you see to doing that? I won't tell any remote. I don't know who they are. Yeah. Maybe personally, uh, as my job market come closer time, um, and so like um, uh, maybe some concern of not getting an answer in time before the job market. Closes. Yeah. Yeah, so the time element is really interesting because you could you could like hit it out of the ballpark and it would be done and then it would be a registered report. And that would be great. Or it might be somewhere in the middle. And then it's kind of weird because you're like, well, um, the study isn't done. Um, 
I have actually in a job talk uh, talked about a study that I am doing as a registered report, and that actually ended up working out really well as like a this is in my future direction. This is already accepted at a journal, but if it's like your job market paper and it doesn't make it all the way through, then you might have to like delay by a whole year. A bummer. Yeah. Other barriers. Yeah. Uh, if you're starting out with doing like a registered report, that could also be new to your PI as well. So it's in transition to even wanting to be on board with that. Yeah. So you kind of have to convince your mentor, unless you're like super independent and they just don't care. But usually at this point, most mentors will not have done a registered report before. They maybe have done a pre registration, maybe. And so figuring out how to get them on board on your thing, that's going to be tricky. Yeah. Other things? Okay. Uh, like yeah. Just the just knowledge uh, gap that you may not anticipate, like, because you, you kind of have to find out what you're what you're registered, uh, what your data analysis plan is, right? So yes. Yeah. Kind of yeah. It might be. Yeah. It might be like right now, you know that eventually you're going to take a multi level modeling class. And then once you have the data, then you'll know how to do multi level modeling. So then you'll apply what you learned in the multi level modeling class with your data. But right now, you don't know how to do that. Um, I just had a consulting meeting with somebody who like just did their dissertation proposal and one of their proposal involved doing an SEM and they came to me and they were like, okay, I don't know how to do SEM. And I was like, oh, okay. So like there is a time you're learning, like this is your training time. You're supposed to be learning things throughout this time. So there might be a gap between what you know now and what you'll eventually know when the data comes in. Yeah. And with that, I wonder too, like if you are writing up your data analysis plan or your potential results, and you're basing it off of one type of like statistical analysis plan or model, and it gets overlooked. Like, is that a possibility that your proposal is not strong enough because you didn't have perhaps like an adequate analysis in mind? And you know, it may like because it, if it was the case that it does get reviewed, you get that feedback, and then it's like let's do this analysis instead. That's great, because then you have direction in terms of like where to go from there and what you need to fill in the gaps. Yeah, yeah. But otherwise, like, which, is it possible that you could try your best with trying to find the most adequate analysis, but it's still, I don't know, you're not getting the feedback on what it's like to do. Yeah, I think it's unlikely for a or for stage one to get rejected because the analysis plan is like proposing let's say the wrong kind of analysis or something that's not sufficient. One of the things that I've seen, especially as an editor, but also as a reviewer, is that people get invested because it's kind of like, this is the thing that could happen. And so it's very easy as a reviewer to say, hey, you're not taking into account the dependency in your data. So you should be using a multi-level model, even though you said you're going to use the linear regression. I did that. For, as a reviewer, um, I didn't see it as a fatal flaw because I can just say, hey, change this in the revision. Um, and the nice thing is I like getting that feedback up front rather than on the back end because it feels kind of pee happy on the back end where you're like, well, I did this analysis. This was the best analysis that I could come up with. But now reviewer two is asking me to do something else. And I don't know if it's because they don't like the results that I came up with or they think it's a better analysis. At the point at which you have the results, you can't tell the difference. And so I do think that there is like a whole thing about reviewers pee hacking for you, um, where they're asking you to do things, but you're like, mm, I don't know. Um, so yeah, there is that element. But I do think a lot of the time you get just get the feedback on the analysis plan. Um, and it's not usually seen as like a super fatal flaw. One of the things that I did run into as an editor is that there was a team that um, they proposed a linear regression, but their data was actually nested. And so I said, hey, you need to use a multi-level model. And then they wrote back to me in just like an email and they said, we don't know how to do a multi-level. 
And I just like looked up what institution they were at. And I was like, I know somebody at your institution who knows how to do multi-level models. Let me connect you. Um, and so, so now that person is on that paper and helping with the analyses. And so like in the end, it's a-okay. Um, I, as an editor, I'm very like methods focused. I really don't care about the question. Well, I don't know, it sounds interesting. So yeah. So, oh yeah, okay. Um, I'm gonna show you a TikTok. Because we're. Hey, Professor, I'm here for a meeting to continue working on that research paper. Great. Where do we leave off? I know we just met last week and had a very detailed conversation about this project, but as your advisor, I forgot about 95% of that discussion. And I'm slowly learning to not internalize that as a form of personal rejection. Looking at the analyses now, I see we ran analysis A, but I think we should run analysis B instead. Okay, but I'm going to spend the next 10 minutes trying to remind you how we had this conversation last week and you decided that analysis A was the better choice. And then I'm going to disregard all of that and say we run analysis B over the weekend anyway. You say we, but you really mean me. You got me there, but don't worry, I will vastly underestimate how long it will take for you to put in this extra work and reassure you that it'll just take a few minutes. And after I put all that extra effort in, you're gonna remember why option A was better. That's probably accurate. <laughs> it probably is. Well, good luck on that analysis that I'm gonna change my mind on again. I'll see you next week. See you next week. I'm gonna forget this conversation as soon as you walk out the door. <laughs> okay, how many of you have ever experienced anything like that? I have, for sure, all the time. You don't have to raise your hand if you don't want to. But um, it's a very common experience. Oh, I don't know how to get this back. See, it's just like this now. I'm on the other side. Nope, that got smaller. Okay, we're just big now. Um, so this is a really common experience where you have to get an analysis plan approved by your advisor before you can really continue on with a paper. Um, and I think registered reports can help with this problem because you have to agree on the analysis plan before you ever have the data. And so if your advisor is, and I don't think anybody's ever really like doing this really like, like super on purpose, but they see an analysis, it didn't support what they thought happened. And so they assume you did it wrong. You didn't include some covariate. You didn't, you know, there's something wrong about what you did. And so they ask you to redo the analysis. And that's okay. So there's this weird exchange that happens between the mentor and the mentee, where there's a back and forth about an analysis when the data actually exists. And if all of that happens before the data exists, then we know it's not any amount of p hacking or herking or any of these questionable practices. But instead, um, there still has to be a back and forth, and there's going to be. And Tristan and I have done this back and forth a lot, um, but before the data ever existed, right? Um, so it's helpful, I think, to, to go through this process with a registered report. Um, you have to agree before the data is available, and what that does is it can reduce. I, I want like a name for this thing that happens, because I think there's a funny name for it. But if you think of one, let me know. Um, you also have a record of your plan to refer back to. And so later, if you do the analysis and you give it to your advisor, and they say, oh, should have included a covariate here, then you can say, nope, we didn't put it in the free registration or we didn't put it in the registered report, right? So I don't think that we should do that. Or at the very least, we should report both of them. And the one where you add the covariate has to be an exploratory analysis for the registered report. Oh, got big. I don't know how to have it. So some of the advice I have for getting your advisor on board, because you kind of can't really do this unless your advisor is okay with you doing it. Um, many advisors may not see the immediate benefit of a registered report. They've been doing this a long time. They've been successful in academia so far, hopefully. Um, and so just the path of least resistance is the way that many mentors go. Um, I say this as a mentor and I still mean myself. So um, figuring out a way to kind of sell them on this is really important. You can use information from this presentation to try to convince them, or you can send them to me. <laughs> um, uh, we also have some like follow-up focus group things that you could send them to. Um, but there's meta science on this. There's a lot of research now looking at the benefits of registered reports, um, and I think that it's fairly clear. Try pre-registration before you try a full-blown registered report. So it's kind of like a, a an entry point for potentially as a trainee. You can say, 
oh, why don't we pre-register this? And your advisor will go, okay, you can do that. Go off, do that. Um, and now you've kind of already done it, right? And so it's a, a way to get in the door. Um, also do your homework to preempt concerns from your mentor. So um, at least in doing these trainings a bazillion times, people are very concerned about scooping. One of the biggest concerns. And your my mentor might also be concerned about scooping. So it's definitely a good idea to have like a response ready to talk about why scooping probably isn't a problem. Um, or at least be like, you submit grants, don't you? You know, um, you can be kind of, you don't have to do that. But, um, but think about the things that your mentor specifically might have problems with and you can try to preempt those. And if you're like, oh, I think my mentor is gonna say this, but I don't know what to say, you can email me, you can email William, you can email Tristan, um, and we will help you. Um, one of the, I think, best points to try to get at your mentor is that we already do this. UCLA does it, every PhD granting institution does it. You do a dissertation proposal. You have to. It's part of the training mechanism for like every PhD granting institution. That's a registered report where you take a document that says, here's what I'm gonna do. And then three people who are experts in your field give you feedback on it and then you revise it and then you go off and you do it. That's a registered report. It's just not guaranteeing a publication. And so if your advisor buys that you should be doing a dissertation proposal, they should also buy that you should do a registered report. It's also the idea if you're integrating this into the, the thesis defense and your proposal, if that's already part of you know, what you're planning on doing for a specific project, then you can use that to advocate for a registered report. So I, as a committee member, frequently when I'm on a, a dissertation proposal, I will say, wow, this is a really great study. Wouldn't it be great if we just took this document and submitted it as a stage one, and then we got it accepted as a registered report? And now two of the committees that I've been on, the student's paper is done as a registered report. Um, so you might not always have somebody on your committee who will advocate for that, but you can also advocate for it. Yes. Fine. I know. I see the okay. time. Sorry. Yeah, that's fine. Um, time management is a little bit different from a student perspective, as we talk about with like the job market and how that works. So one thing that can be particularly tricky is lining the timing with your program deadlines. So thinking about well, I need to have data collection done before my thesis defense, probably, um, then you want to think in advance about registered reports. So it might be as a trainee, you don't do a registered report for things that are like core to your program milestones because that time is like very specific. Um, or you can kind of use it to leverage those things. So um, scheduled review can help with this. PCIRR has scheduled reviews. There's also a couple other journals, but like there's, it's not as widely adopted enough for me to say, oh yeah, you can definitely schedule your review unless you do it through the, the PCIRR mechanism. For dissertations, um, I would recommend submitting your stage one around the time of your thesis proposal or even before um, because you're probably gonna get a revision back and then you'll be getting feedback from your committee at the same time that you're getting feedback from peer reviewers and then you can just integrate it all and then run your study. So that ends up kind of working pretty well. Um, know that revisions are possible. And so uh, your first stage one submission is not your last stage one submission. Most of the time, um, you'll probably have at least one round of revision. And plan for a typical review period, whatever that is in your field, before you start data collection. If you have specific time limitations, you can express that to the editor and that can help them try to get things rolling, but it doesn't always work. The last thing I wanna say is that open science is a buffet. So these things that we're talking about with registered reports, pre-registration, open data, all of that is a buffet in the sense that you do not have to eat every single one of these desserts. You can, it's delicious. Um, it's a great life to live, but you can also come up and you can say, ah, for this study, I will choose pre-registration and I'm gonna go home. I did, you don't have to do everything as a registered report all at once. It might make you sick. So um, especially as a trainee, it's totally acceptable not to just do all of these things all at once. 
everywhere, right? Um, but you can try different things and figure out how things work. And then as you progress as a scientist, you can start adopting more things if you so choose. Any other additional concerns as trainees, things come up? Tried to get them all. I didn't, but I tried. Let me talk a little bit about getting credit because I think that this is important. So um, this, this study specifically, I think is the best study out there for saying registered reports are really good science. So there's some concern for some of the previous research that looked at registered reports and comparing registered reports to traditional studies, that maybe registered reports are, they're safer. Like maybe people don't choose risky things. It's kind of opposite of why you do a registered report, but. So um, this study compared pairs of registered reports and traditional papers in psychology and neuroscience. And they were rated by peer reviewers um, on 19 criteria. And the main findings are that Registered reports are considered more rigorous and of higher quality. They're not less innovative or novel, and they're about equal on everything else. And so in general, I, at least based on this study, there's kind of nothing that registered reports are insufficient on. Um, and so I think it's worthwhile to take credit for doing something that is of high quality um, and interesting. So when you're on the job market, what you can do is manuscripts with an in-principle acceptance, I think look way better than something that's under review or in prep. Um, you should definitely include anything that you have as an in-principle acceptance on your CD when you're applying for jobs. I know sometimes people will say don't put in prep or even some under review things um, on your CD. Definitely put things that have an in-principle acceptance. Um, plan to educate people about what a registered report is. I'll give you an example of a footnote that I put in my job materials um, to explain to people what these things are. Um, and many departments, especially for those of you in psychology, are actually asking for a separate statement that's an open science statement. Or at the very least, they're asking for you to comment on open science practices in your research statement. And so saying that you've done a registered report puts you in like a upper echelon A plus open sciencer. Um, so it's a very good thing to have um, and have tried. You can also annotate your CV, which I think is very fun. Um, so this is my CV, <laughs> the whole thing. Um, no, so uh, actually at the beginning of my publication section, I have this little thing where I have these little badges and some of these are like the open science badges, but then other ones are just things that I kind of made up. So I made a registered report badge because there isn't one. Um, and then I have like open access and then preprints. Um, and most of these like click to a link um, where someone can look at the pre-registration or they can do these things. Um, and so this is a nice way to kind of indicate to other people that you're open science friendly is to have these kinds of things indicated on your CV. Um, and I think it's pretty, so it's fun. Um, this is a footnote that I put in my job materials because I refer to registered reports a lot. Um, and so this is just text that you are welcome to take um, and put into your stuff to explain what a registered report is. And especially if you mention a project in your materials that is an in-principle acceptance, you wanna explain what that is most people don't know. Um, most of you are not tenure faculty, but kind of same advice for promotion and tenure, specifically for UCLA, I now know that in principle acceptances should be listed in section C. That doesn't mean anything to you, it doesn't matter. Um, just talk a little bit about advocating for change. So one thing to be aware of is there's this great group called Registered Reports Now, and you can reach out to them to advocate for certain journals to adopt registered reports. So if your favorite journal doesn't do registered reports yet, you can help. Um, and so you, this group helps with um, educating editors and um, reaching out to editors to ask them to uh, adopt registered reports at their journal um, and help in any way that they can. So they have like template policies and a lot of resources to help journals adopt. Um, if any of you are teaching statistics or methods courses at the graduate or undergraduate level, you can teach them about registered reports. 
And undergrads eat this stuff up. They are so into it. It's just the way that science should happen. Um, there are a lot of examples of registered reports that you could use in your teaching. So you can um, choose to teach examples that are registered reports. And um, we are also developing some uh, teaching modules related to registered reports. And we're happy to work with you if you want a slide deck or something to incorporate into your class. Um, we're happy to help with that. The last thing is if any of you are editors or associate editors, um, think about adopting registered reports. Um, many journals start with a special issue. This is actually a nice tidbit, is that uh, most journals that have adopted registered reports started with a special issue that was just one editor, and then and then it got adopted like worldwide at the journal. Um, and consider joining PCIRR. Uh, yeah, that's advocating for change. So the last thing that I want to mention is if um, any of your colleagues, you think that they should learn about registered reports, we are currently running a study that is a focus group um, where we teach people about registered reports. They have to fill out some surveys, answer some questions. Um, we're aiming for early career researchers. So graduate students, postdocs, and assistant professors, we're kind of willing to accept just about anybody. So um, if this is of interest to you or you want to recommend this to your lab group, or a committee that you're on, anything like that, we can run a focus group for them. So more information there. Um, and this will lead you to a form that will um, fill this out. A couple other resources I want to mention is there is a really great Twitter thread by a registered report author about kind of their experience. So if somebody wants to like, somebody's like, this is going to be awful, then you can send them this Twitter thread and it's very great. There's a Zotero list of papers um, about registered reports. So this is kind of a, a collection of the meta science about registered reports. And um, this is a, a website that is by a, an author who's done multiple registered reports and they've provided a bunch of different templates for different kinds, of secondary data analysis, qualitative, et cetera. Um, so thanks for your time, your attention, your energy during this of finals week. Um, this is the uh, focus group QR code. Here are the slides. This is contact information for me and William. You could probably Google Tristan if you also wanted to contact him. Um, yeah, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Adri, for hosting us. Um, and feel free to take like a bunch of snacks as you leave um, because we don't need all of those. Um, yeah, thanks for joining us. Um, and we will kind of hang out as we clean up. If you have any questions, then we're happy to field those. Sorry, I kind of rushed through a lot of things at the end. I don't know, are there any questions? Or any questions in the moment? Yes. I was just wondering whether there are any kind of studies that are more accepted to be like accepted as a registered report. Um, yeah, I think I. I don't know. I think the, the most important thing is for you to convince the reviewers that the results are interesting either way. So especially if you use null hypothesis significance testing, that a uh, significant result or a not significant result or the results going in either direction or null, that that is informative. And a lot of that comes from statistical power. So you want to have a study that's well powered enough to differentiate between interesting effects and uninteresting effects. Um, I should have said interesting effects and uninteresting effects. Um, but that there is a, a literature around smallest effect size of interest that I think is really valuable when you're talking about the sample size justification in registered reports to say, you know, if this effect is any smaller than 0.01, then our field should not care about it. And so we're going to power to detect 0.01. And if it's not there, then that's enough. And we can just say it's effect isn't real. Um, so yeah, part of it is that power to um, that like sample size and other things that affect the power. Well, I'll just add that from listening from the mentor's perspective, a lot of mentors do replication as a way of doing a registered report. So if you're looking to get buy-in from your mentor, if you pitch a replication, then that tends to be how you can get your mentor to buy into doing a registered report. If you're like, oh, you're replicating another study, sure, let's do that as a registered report, which can also get buy-in from getting registered reports as well. So 
We don't know if your mentor will be on board. That's the question. Do you have a sense of how their replications seem to do pretty well as a registered report because it's like it's automatically interesting in the sense of like if it does replicate, we want to know, and if it doesn't replicate, we really want to know. Um, and so there was this, I don't remember who introduced this, but I love this idea called the pottery barn rule, which is you break it, you buy it. Um, and so if you're replicating a study from a specific journal, submitting it as a registered report to that journal, they should really want to know whether or not that original study is going to replicate. And most of them are like, oh yeah, this will be great for us. It'll replicate and it'll just be better for us and we'll get cited. And so they don't think about the alternative, but they accepted it anyway. Um, so there are some people out there who advocate for this, like the pottery barn rule of like, if you publish an original study, you should also be willing to commit to publishing any replication of the study. Um, and there are some journals that have committed to that. JPSP is actually one of them. Um, but, uh, not all journals have like committed to that. Yeah. Um, on the topic of like thinking about replication studies for the report. I was looking around because I was being curious, like, oh, I have an idea. Um, and for one of the journals of interest that accept those types of reports, they mentioned that they only consider proposals that involve like multiple laboratories. Mm, that's yes. common. Um, I think that might just be AMPS. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so AMPS is kind of an odd journal because they are, um, they're, a methods journal, um, but they also, it's kind of weird because a lot of the open science literature goes there. And so originally they were just replications. Now they're only multi-lab, um, but actually the new editor is a lot more flexible than the old one. Um, and so uh, I actually know someone who's doing a registered report there that's a simulation study. Um, and that so that's not multi-lab, but they are doing it as a registered report. So. If there's something of interest, I would say reach out to the editor because the editor can give you like a litmus test of like that's an acceptable registered report here. If this one's not, there are some journals that only do replications. That's like all they've committed to at this point in time. Um, but I have heard of a, a lot of people, not a lot, but a couple cases where people reached out to those journals that say that they only do replications and asked if they could do like a replication and an extension. And they were like, yeah, that sounds great. Like, the rules are flexible. Okay. Yeah. Um, one question I had was um, whether certain studies are more appealing than others in, in the sense of, uh, for instance, the type of population you can reach and or have access to, for instance, I don't know, in countries that uh, are typically less accessible or like a field study with an organization. Yeah, um, especially in marketing, the registered reports that I've seen are mostly field studies. Um, uh, uh, gosh, I'm trying to think of the name. There was a guy who came to the marketing department uh, who worked with Ashley Willens on a registered report that's at NHB. Um, but so, so I think a good pitch for a registered report is if you have access to a, like a rare or hard to reach population, something that's anything that's expensive, and that could be time or resources, or whatever, then it's an easier pitch as a registered report to say, look at this access to these people that I have. I don't want to waste it. Please accept my paper regardless of what I find, um, because I'm not willing to do it unless you're willing to do it. Um, so it's kind of a, a two-way street. Yeah. Okay, I want to let us go, but I will hang out up here, and we will be here for a couple more minutes if anyone else has other questions. So thank you so much. I know this is a long, long session. I don't have a stock to report. Yeah, I was